Good morning, everyone. Um, please accept my good morning as, um, I guess, my gavel to open this hearing. Um, my name is Tanya Fernandez Anderson. Uh, for the record, my name is Tanya Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity channel eight, RCN channel 82 and files channel 964. The council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings that begin in April and will run through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Attend one of the hearings and public testimony. We will take public testimony at the end of each departmental hearing and or uh, in the middle, depending on the uh, format of each hearing uh, dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash TV. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony are Tuesday, May 9th at 6 p.m and Thursday, May 18th at 2 p.m. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at cccwm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation or residence and limit your comments to a few minutes to ensure that the comments are being, all comments are being heard. Email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Submit a two minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the city budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on dockets 07 Six zero zero seven six two orders for the FY24 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits, OPEP. Dockets 0763, 0765 to 0766, orders for the capital fund transfer appropriations. Dockets 0764, 0767, 0768 orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be the FY24 budget for the Office of Language and Communication Access, the Office of Immigrant Immigration Advancement, the Disabilities Commission, and the Office of Veterans Services. I do not have a list of the panelists, um, nor do I see anyone here with us, other than uh, Chief uh, Wong. I see now. I now see Monique. Uh, okay. Give me a moment here. Um, I apologize. I was not sent the updated um, panel list. So I'm just gonna. Look it up for proper title. Also, the central staff in your office should have that list of panelists. I also do see Andrea Patron on the uh, not as panelists. If she can be bumped, that would be great. She's on the Disability Commission. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chantel. Unfortunately, I don't have the list. Um, so if you can bump it up to me, Chantel, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, I'm here now. Um, so our panelists for today's hearing are for Office of Language uh, Access, Communication Access is Jennifer Vivar Wong, Office of Immigrant Advancement, Monique Nguyen, uh, a director. Kristen McCosh, is Kristen here? Uh, hi, Kristen. Yes. 
Commissioner uh, Kristen McCosh, Disabilities Commission. Commissioner Robert Santiago from uh, Veterans. And Bella Jambuso, Senior Administration, Alan S. Betts as well. Thank you. Uh, now that we're caught up, I'm joined here today by my council colleagues, uh, Council President Ed Flynn, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Braden, Councillor Lujan, Councillor Mejia. For our format, um, because we have about four different departments, uh, we hope to get out of here by two o'clock hopefully spending an hour or less on each department. Um, I will allow my council colleagues to just give an opening statement if they have it. By show of hands, if you raise your hand, I will call on to you for a 30 second opening statement. If you don't have one, that's okay. We'll move on to administration uh, presentation. Then uh, if we have, if my council colleagues have any questions, we'll go to our first round. Uh, if there are any public testimonies, we'll take that second. And then if there's time, we'll take, we'll do a second round of questions thereafter. Um, first, Mr. Uh, President Council Ed Flynn, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the department heads that are here with us. All four of them play a critical role in the city, providing critical services, programs, and services to residents I think these four departments are the most important departments in the city of Boston. As you know, language and communication access has been a priority. And I believe that every city department should also place language and communication access as part of their priorities. It's a critical department and we wanna work closely with this team they're doing an outstanding job to make sure every resident's, resident has access to language and communication access. I represent a large immigrant community as well. And the, the importance of the Office of Immigrant Advancement plays a critical role in Boston, making sure our immigrant neighbors are treated with respect. Disability Commission, another important department. Uh, it's, in critical, it's critical that we ensure Every person with disability has equal access, full access to buildings and spaces. And um, disability, person with disabilities also fully engage and participate in our community, deserving, deserving of respect and dignity. Finally, veteran services. I'm a, I'm a disabled veteran. I also work closely with this department, making sure there are services and programs for veterans and, and their families. Um, I know all four department heads, they're doing a tremendous job. Their team is also doing a tremendous job and um, I'm here to listen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Council President Flynn. Council Mejia, did you have your hands up? I did, Councillor Anderson, um, but in the interest of time, I think I will reserve my comments um, during my questions. Thank you. No problem. Um, all right, without further ado, um, uh, Ms. Ms. Wong, you have the floor for your presentation. Um, if, Ethan, uh, if we can get, uh, did you submit a presentation, Ms. Wong? I did, Madam Chair. Good morning. Um, mm -hmm. Ethan, if you're, if you're ready for, with the uh, Office of Language Acts, Communication and Access, Uh, good morning. Um, sorry, uh, just for a moment, I wanted to acknowledge my council colleague, Erin Murphy. Um, for some reason, I don't see her screen. Oh, there it is. It's just a longer title. Sorry, um, your name sort of disappears, um, Council Murphy. Um, we, we are, we're here. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge her presence. Ethan, whenever you're ready with the presentation. Um, 
Thank you so much. Um, so um, thank you everyone and thank you for the time. It's, it's an honor to be here with you all. Um, so we are the Office of Language and Communications Access. Um, if I could kindly ask for you to move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so our mission is up on the screen, but our office um, prioritizing ensuring that speakers of all languages and communications backgrounds are able to access all city services and that they also are seen as a critical role in the decision making of the city. Um, we are a little bit different from most uh, language access offices across the city as we are a combination of language access and communications access, uh, which is um, uh, priorities of persons who speak languages other than English and persons with uh, communications access related disability. So that can include persons who identify as deaf, persons who identify as um, having low vision, persons who identify as hard of hearing, and persons who are identified as blind. Um, next slide, please. And so another um, difference that we have compared to other language access offices is we approach our work in a decentralized model approach. And so as Councilor Ed Flynn was mentioning, um, we view that in order to ensure language and communications access is successful, that it needs to be a systemic change within the city. And that is why we make language and communications access a priority for all departments and to be a forefront um, uh, before planning, before information is being created, as well as events. And so I'm going to go over a little bit of how we are broken down to accomplish this vision uh, for our decentralized model. So we have um, administrative and compliance uh, piece of our work is setting standards, policies, and procedures for which departments will um, execute their work. And in order to support those departments, we also have um, a team that focuses on trainings, which is training departments on how to provide accessible events, accessible content, how to provide on-demand interpretation, which is um, employee language um, in the scenario that someone walks into the city and needs an interpreter um, without any um, uh, preparation or awareness from the department in advance. Um, we also, um, provide resources to LCA liaisons within every department. So each department has a liaison who is tasked with advancing the work of language and communications access, and we work closely with those liaisons. We also have, um, from our investments from fiscal year 23, we have um, LCA specialists. And the easiest way that I can explain um, their role, think of them as kind of mini consultants to departments. And so they do more of the one-on-one um, uh, -on -one supports to departments and rolling out um, implementation and compliance. Next slide, please. We also have um, a research analyst and uh, there is a variety of uh, things that fall into this category, uh, but most importantly, it is research on local and state and federal policies around language access. Um, another um, effort that we're um, aiming to uh, achieve in our office is also being aware of language access requirements of agencies in Boston as well, um, and other um, miscellaneous research projects that happen there as well as knowing and staying up to date to the needs of constituents in Boston when it comes to language access, disability access, and also being aware of all the intersectional identities um, that um, are being brought by our constituencies that we serve. Um, in terms of outreach and comms, we are not a uh, front-facing department. Um, however, we do uh, elevate and support departments who are doing that front-facing work and disseminating information, so uplifting their work. Uh, we also partner closely with CBOs for special translation projects, as well as um, being able to uh, attend uh, meetings with other um, folks on the equity cabinet, as well as beyond, to hear concerns around language access and disability access. The last piece of our work is um, uh, contracts and uh, accommodations. So we do hold the city's contracts for um, language interpretation, spoken language uh, interpretation and translation services. We also hold the city contract for over the phone interpretation and video remote interpretation, as well as procuring simultaneous interpretation equipment and additional devices that would be helpful for um, implementation of this work. 
Um, next slide, please. Thank you. This is just an overview of how we are organized um, in terms of our office. Next slide, please. And this is a visual representation uh, for, um, it, this is a very big shift from last year's presentation. Uh, it, we went from a team of three, we're now a team of 12 um, employees um, in this fiscal year. So there's two folks who will be joining us in the next two months. Next slide, please. I also want to elevate um, one of our core priorities um, from the beginning, which is creating pipelines of internships to full-time employees. And so we do partner with um, uh, UMass Boston, as well as Roxbury College in uh, bringing in opportunities for, making opportunities for interns within our office to gain experience. And often this will either lead to full-time employment or support in finding employment after graduation. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to highlight some folks that um, were in a part of our internships who are now full-time employees within our office. So you have Sydney, who will be becoming our finance coordinator, Rebecca, who will be joining us as our Spanish translate, in-house Spanish translator, and Larissa, who is currently in our office right now as our LCA specialist. Next slide, please. And just to kind of go over the history of LCA, um, um, before my time uh, in 2016, the first reiteration of our ordinance was passed, which created this office as a program. So it wasn't until around, and we were housed under neighborhood services. So it wasn't until around 2021 where the amended ordinance on language and communication access established our department as an office. Um, and at that time we were at three full-time employees. Um, last year we became a standalone department where we were able to hire two more employees, which is uh, brought us to five. And now in 2023, thank you to your efforts, we are also up at 12 full-time employees. Next slide, please. And I wanted to highlight some of the accomplishments for this fiscal year and also um, say thank you to my team who is watching, who without them, this work wouldn't be possible. Um, we are on track to release in the upcoming fiscal year departmental plans, um, which will outline um, how departments will be implementing language access and communications access within their work, as well as um, publicizing vital documents lists and also translations of vital documents and vital information, um, as well as releasing a formal complaint uh, process, which will allow constituents to file um, complaints around language access or communications access, not only to city departments, but also agencies across Boston. Um, and we have established large scale interpretation and translation contracts. Thank you again for your efforts um, with um, funding this year. Uh, and for continuing, uh, we've also been continuing to increase uh, foundational knowledge in the city, uh, which is up to date. We've had, we've trained over a thousand employees on providing over the phone interpretation as well as video interpretation. We've trained over 800 City of Boston staff on uh, introductory training to LCA. And we created a new training this year that focused on targeting directors, chiefs, and managers, as well as LCA liaison with inside departments focused on the implementation of language and communications access. And so that is why that number is 126, but we're continuing to grow those trainings as well. Um, and then uh, another partnership that we've had is working closely with the Boston Police Department, where we have now um, gotten the green light to embed our trainings into their e-learning course, which will um, is for mandatory in-service training for their veteran officers as well as hosting in-person trainings annually for their new recruits in the police academy. Um, there are other exciting developments um, as well with that partnership, which I'm happy to answer um, later on as well. Um, and of course, the big one is increasing our capacity from two full-time employees from the inception of the program to now, I apologize as a typo, now it's 12 full-time employees. Um, and of course, our increased partnership uh, with um, uh, Roxbury College and other organizations to continue this pipeline of offering opportunities um, to students, uh, not only for experience, but ultimately full-time employment. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. Um, and then our priorities for fiscal year 24 is the continuing expansion of our contracts, putting in place a contract for American Sign Language interpretation, as well as CART services, um, increasing public awareness to the rights of language access and accommodations, um, increasing public awareness of accommodations being provided by the city, continuing to elevate all of the great work that's coming out of departments. Um, uh, one new investment in this year is grants for external language access support. Um, and these will be focused on community-based organizations that have um, a diverse base of community members who come for support but may not have all the multilingual capacity or ability to support everyone in um, their language or communication style. So we're hoping that this funding will allow for um, CBOs to increase um, their language access and communications access work. And of course, I think this is going to be foundationally continuous is um, continue to train City of Boston staff on how to um, implement language and communications access, the processes and procedures um, that us as an office are implementing. And um, that is all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jennifer. Um, great presentation. By order of arrival, I'm going to ask my council colleagues if you have questions. Um, I have Council President Flynn, but if you want to raise your hand, that's okay too. Or if not, I'll ask everyone in the order. Okay. Uh, Council President Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I will be brief because I, I had the opportunity to meet with Jennifer um, earlier this week. Um, so thank you, Jennifer, for your presentation. It was it was very helpful. Tell me, tell me um, going forward, what are what's your main priority as as it relates to making sure our immigrant neighbors um, have access to ensure their voice is heard in city government? What's the most important thing you're going to do to try to um, make sure every resident has a voice? Thank you for that question, Councilor Flynn. Um, I think in order for us to ensure that constituents have a voice or feel comfortable enough to, uh, and I want to be careful with my, um, um, have the ability to play uh, a part in everything that's being done in the city. I think the first project that we're rolling out now is really around how do we create a space where um, in line with the mayor's vision of creating a city for everyone, creating a welcoming city. And so one of the important projects that we're working on now and um, is being led by our chief of staff, Diana Daniel, is a partnership with um, the second, first and third floor tellers in the front facing departments on that floor. So this is an exciting project where we are partnering with, um, uh, and I'm gonna miss some departments, but uh, parking, uh, registry, um, treasury, collections, um, who have been trained on providing interpretation both over the phone and um, through video mode interpretation. And I think our vision for this is ensuring that once you walk into the city, you are, um, especially for, to do services that are the most front facing, you are going to be seeing a change on those floors where we'll actually be equipping these departments with iPads that will be loaded with video remote interpretation service. So if you walk up to go pay your parking ticket, or if you use the accessible teller, uh, which is um, uh, designed for persons who use a wheelchair, you'll be able to uh, see that there'll be signage posted that will tell you in language your rights to interpretation and translation. It'll also allow you to um, view at the, at the front of the tellers a uh, language identification card, which has different languages in language. So you can say, I speak um, Spanish, you can point to the language, and that teller will be able to contact and bring up an interpreter on demand, whether it be spoken language or ASL, who will be able to support you in the language that you need. I think a lot of our uh, priorities and projects have been, how do we ensure that the most front-facing departments are and the ones who are constantly working with constituents do uh, um, are prepared and trained on providing accommodations, which I think ultimately will lead to that trust building that we need to make um, and uh, welcoming of and reaching our vision of creating language justice in the city, which is the concept of not only having um, respect for all languages, but also respect um, in the terms that all languages can coexist um, together and in this space. And so that is 
the priority is how do we start with um, addressing the departments who are the most front facing, the most important. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I want to be careful with my words. Every department is important, but the most front facing departments so that uh, the constituents who are going uh, to these departments feel welcome, seen, heard, and of course, accepted in the sense of we are prioritizing language justice. Th thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Madam Chair, I have no further questions. Just want to say thank you to Jennifer and her team. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, you're on, you're on mute. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Um, Council Flaherty, you have five minutes for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for the Executive Director uh, um, for her presentation. Uh, Jennifer, obviously, as you know, uh, prior to your arrival, the Boston City Council has uh, always led in these efforts, uh, making sure that we have the ability um, to uh, transliterate all of our services uh, that we provide residents as well as including ballots, et cetera. So um, let us know how we can help you do your job uh, most effectively. Uh, it's important, uh, particularly as a citywide city council, we represent uh, everyone. And, um, uh, and that means uh, that we need to make sure that we're keeping up with uh, all of our materials and brochures um, in our departments and services that we offer and provide. And then uh, I guess my question is, because we've had um, uh, folks from IT and chief information officer on the other day, and, just making sure that maybe your department is working with his department closely, because once that material becomes online or once there's an announcement that needs to be made or once there's a, a service that is now accessible online, because we are asking constituents um, to try to transact business to the best of their ability online. Most folks prefer that um, than to have to come downtown, try to find a parking space, get a ticket, uh, have to come into the building. So making sure that uh, your department and uh, the IT department are, are on the same page with respect to uh, language access and the services we provide. So uh, that's sort of my opine. That's my question, I guess, is making sure that uh, asking that you do uh, work closely with uh, IT and then continue to just let us know as your department continues to grow, if the demand for those services continue to grow um, as the legislative branch of city government, we need to know about that so that we could uh, be working with the chair of Ways and Means, our colleagues to make sure that you have um, the personnel uh, and the resources that you need to carry out your function uh, so that we can continue to lead on this issue and continue to make sure that uh, all folks feel welcome here and all folks can transact business here and all folks can feel that uh, City Hall is their City Hall and that we all, everyone on this screen and beyond, municipal employees work for them. We work for the residents and the taxpayers of the city and, uh, and so we wanna make sure that uh, and we're an open book on that front. So uh, thank you, Executive Director Wong. And, um, and just if you can share with us the, the, the program that you have right now and how closely you work with IT, that'd be great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Councillor. Um, so I, yes. So with the, uh, going back to the LCA specialists and our model of them kind of serving as mini consultants, we do have all LCA specialists assigned to departments. So, um, the way that we've um, kind of grouped them is that we've let departments know that they have an LCA specialist that's assigned on top of the LCA liaison who supports their implementation work. The LCA specialist is that person that um, they can go to in case of emergencies or in case they're uh, planning some kind of large event and information. We get tapped in to provide guidance and support, especially um, elevating what the standards are in the city and how they should make sure that accessibility is working through everything that they do. In terms of um, right now, we're also closing, working closely with Treasury, um, who and, uh, has a lot of uh, vital documents that go out personally to um, households. And what we're working with them is ensuring that uh, they have already babbles on the mailers that they send out, uh, also working on how we can create tailored babbles um, that provide a little bit more information to constituents of the mailers that they're receiving. Um, that's just the glimpse of the work that we're doing. There's so much more that we're doing, but in terms of keeping in touch with departments, we also have monthly meetings with all the LCA liaisons of the departments. Um, so we have, I guess, the first point of contact is the trainings, the LCA liaison, 
part of those departments and meeting monthly with our teams. And then the LCA specialists who are assigned to each department. And the LCA specialists um, who are incredible, amazing folks on our team are always up to date in terms of making sure that they're keeping up with the press releases coming out of the office, checking with um, their departments, um, and then they also campaigns um, at all hours of the day um, for guidance and additional support um, from departments as needed. Very good. Now, I don't know, uh, something may have happened to my screen here. I don't know what happened, but thank you for your response. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm really pleased to see that you've got actually more, more employees to help you deliver these very important services. Um, one question I had was with regard to um, just uh, accessibility for uh, visually impaired uh, residents. Do we, do we provide materials uh, and access in Braille? And also uh, deaf and hard of hearing uh, residents um, how do we support those folks and, and what sort of partnerships do we have with other uh, organizations that may be more specialized knowledge of working with Braille and um, hard of hearing residents? Thank you so much, Councillor, for your question. Um, so I'm going to make sure that I address all the points. Uh, so for Braille, we are able to translate materials into Braille as requested. I. I can send you a study that we did where it shows that the actual uses of Braille, uh, Braille there's a whole Braille Literacy Awareness Month, is, is, is not as high um, as we would expect, uh, but we do have the ability to translate, I'm sorry, um, to create materials into Braille as requested. Um, as in terms of large prints for persons who have low vision. Uh, one thing that we are doing this um, year, and you'll see as we release vital documents, we are ensuring that all English versions of documents are also not only English, but there's a large print um, uh, version of it as well available. Um, in this list, this will be publicized out. Um, and then in terms of working with organizations, we actually, um, for the project that I spoke about in, uh, in partnership with the first, second, third floors, we're actually working with Commissioner Makash and Monique who are on this call as well um, on that project. And we also partner with Work Inc who is going to be hosting, and they hosted this last year as well, a deaf culture training. Um, and uh, we've also partnered, um, we're also in exploration phases of working with uh, the Perkins um, School, who would also be doing an additional training, uh, but that is still in the works uh, of, of figuring out um, kind of the content and what will be uh, pushed forward. But those are one of the goals this year, as well as not only thinking about, because we have procedural trainings, which, you know, say, how do you acquire an interpreter? How do you acquire a translation? But another focus that our team has been working on, and, and that's being led by Robbie Adams and um, Florence uh, Glenn in our office, is thinking about, we, as you said, we are not always, um, uh, we want to make sure that we're giving space for the, the folks who are um, representing these communities. So we're also thinking of how do we partner with external um, community-based organizations to provide trainings for the city as a whole. Um, and so last year we did a pilot with deaf culture training. We're hoping to bring it back um, for this project that we mentioned on the first, second and third floor, and then continuing that into the uh, rest of the year as a citywide training available for everybody, um, as well as our partnership with um, the Perkins School. Um, I hope I answered your questions, but if I missed anything, please let me know. I'm so sorry, I think you're muted. Yes, you're right. There you go. This is the problem that we have. If you don't hear, you don't hear. Um, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's all I have for now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Braden. Councilor Lujan, you have the floor. Councilor Lujan, if you can. Sorry, sorry, I was just getting a mute. Um, no worries, you have five minutes, thank you. Thank you, Director Wong, for your presentation and really appreciate the work of your office and really happy to see your office growing. Um, 
it's incredibly important that we are making City Hall accessible um, in the language that folks feel most comfortable. Um, um, as a citywide city councilor and as a, a Haitian American and, and know how important it is for our communities to be able to access City Hall. Um, and we've had the support of your office for an event we're doing tonight in partnership with the Community Preservation Act office, so thank you. Um, along the lines of increasing personnel, um, on the when I'm looking at the budget, it says personnel services is going from 748,000 to just a little bit over 1 million. But it looks like the FTEs are showing only an increase of one person. So like what's happening with that whole $287,000? Um, so for the two hundred thousand um, dollars, I believe that that includes increase in salaries for our staff, um, and then there is that additional full-time um, employee position for our finance coordinator, um, which goes back to um, Sydney, who was an intern in our office as our finance fellow for over two years and is now becoming a full-time employee within our office. Great. So that two hundred and eighty-seven thousand dollars represents increases in pay for members of your staff and a higher and one full-time hire. That's correct. Great. I'm great to. I'm happy to be seeing um, increases to individual salaries. We do not pay people enough uh, to do this really, really important work. Um, as Councillor Council President Flynn said, your office is one of the most important offices in the city, and 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 to see it. Um, uh, supported financially is important, especially uh, folks who do the work of translation, um, incredibly important. Um, I have a question about what is the one service that your office receives a lot of requests about, but you feel like you're unable to provide? I know that even with office expansion, I know that there's limited, my office has been called on for translations. So trying to figure out like what is the most unmet need of your office and, and how are you going about um, meeting that? Um, thank you, Councillor. That is a great question. Um, I think one need that is, 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 I wouldn't say is unmet yet, but we're seeing more of is uh, in the plus side, there's a lot of constituents where trusting us and calling us for complaints that are not related to the city as a whole, but it probably it, it is related to language access or complaints for either like for profit companies or other agencies outside of our jurisdiction. Um, and so that is something that we are starting uh, you know, to track um, to see if that will become something that we, in the next fiscal year, um, uh, may have to evaluate how we're able to support those constituents. Um, right now, what we do is we do triage. We, we have our research analyst, Erica Garcia, who is a, a knowledge source of information when it comes to being aware of the language access plans for different agencies and us being um, um, aware of the standards that uh, are, are under their plans and then being able to work in partnership with agencies and constituents to make sure that we are um, providing the services that the constituents are calling about um, in terms of getting support and, and obtaining. Thank you. Do you work at all with like the Human Rights Commission or with the at Mass Community uh, 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 Commission on uh, against discrimination to refer people when they do feel like they feel been discriminated against when it comes to language access? We or are on ethnicity or anything of that nature. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I cut people off all the time. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, we are, we, we, because of those influx and calls, we have been researching and creating partnerships. Um, right now, we've also been looking into a lot of pro bono organizations um, who give funding, uh, but in, in, for, you know, um, or interpreters at the Greater Boston Legal Services. Um, a lot of the calls we also get is related to connecting constituents with an interpreter for, um, you know, legal proceedings or even connecting them to the, um, uh, the courts in Massachusetts who have their own language access as well and kind of triaging in that sense. Uh, but we, it, it is a relatively new kind of uptake that we've been realizing um, in this office and we are kind of looking to create those um, partnerships and, and the pro bono list is also before this grant um, that we received this year in the fiscal budget, the, um, there was limited capacity in um, kind of us providing translations for outside entities beyond what the ordinance is allowing us to do. So these grants actually have uh, will create that opportunity for us to give to community-based organizations to increase their language access. But we also have a list of pro bono 
organizations that we've been kind of contacting who would be able to provide um, translations or interpretations uh, free of charge to constituents when, when those uh, needs arise. And, and we're finalizing that. Thank you, Director Wong, and thank you for responding. It's great that people know to call your office, even if you're not able to meet their need, and it's great that you're still able to answer them with resources, even if we can't provide it in-house. So thank you for all of your work, really appreciate it. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Thank you, Councilor Mujan. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and Jennifer, it's always great to see you. Um, I'm really excited about uh, the growth um, within your office, so it's really uh, um, inspiring to see. Um, and I um, just have a few questions. You know, a few years ago, you and I worked together on establishing the um, the revised language ordinance to ensure that whatever gets put out in English the same day gets put out in the top 11 languages. And I'm just curious if you can just talk to us a little bit about kind of how that's coming along, what bumps you um, have come across, how have you pivoted, you know, just, just help us understand where we're at with that. And then I'm also curious um, about uh, how are you measuring the impact and the effectiveness of the program and services? You know, what metrics uh, does the department use to evaluate its performances? <laughs> and identify areas of improvement. Like, can you just talk to me about your, I'm always trying to figure out how do we grow? What do we need to do different? How are we pivoting? How are we holding ourselves accountable? So if you could just talk to me a little bit about that, that would be great. And then the last question that I'd love for you to just lean in just a little bit. Um, during our work together, you know, we uh, discussed literacy. When I think about communication and access, I think of those folks who are, um, unable to read and write, even in their own native language. So I know we established a literacy task force, which is about to get off the ground soon, but I'm curious, what else are you doing in terms of making sure that all residents, regardless of their ability to read and write, are able to um, get the information that they need? Thank you, Council Mejia. And it's always great to see you too. I hope that you're feeling better. I know you were um, under the weather a few hearings ago. Um, I wanna, I'll start with your most recent question around the literacy task force. Um, one thing that we do implement within our trainings is this, um, and I know that we've had conversations in the past around the eighth grade reading level. Um, and I know we're going, there, there are conversations that we had to revise, but we have uh, been integrating in our um, trainings, not only practicing plain language when you're writing information, uh, and as well as uh, reminding an eighth grade reading level when it comes to the, the texts that are being formulated. Um, in terms of the, um, information going out at the same time as English, specifically for, and I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, for vital information. Um, specifically, I think also this refers to emergencies like the orange line, um, shut down the COVID-19 response. We have been working closely with the communication, the mayor's communications team. And so we have, um, uh, there is a liaison in that office who oversees uh, language access and disability access. Um, but we also are partnering with them closely as they are uh, the administrators and kind of overseers of all the PIOs in the departments who are the main source of the information that goes out of the city. Um, I, a lot of the work that we're working with them is how do we ensure, because emergencies will happen, right? And our team is happy to step in uh, uh, to support emergencies, but it's also creating systems of the minute we know an emergency is coming, um, a looping in the appropriate folks, lining up the appropriate resources, language access, communications access at the forefront, right? Um, and creating that system in place. Um, we've also, within the contract that we have, we also have established norms of rapid translation as necessary, uh, whether it be, I believe, 24 hours or less of translation requests. And we're also focusing with them of uh, a lot of the communications usually that come out of um, uh, the city in terms of plain language, making sure that we are thinking about vital information and vital documents and recreating them. Because a lot of the times I think in, in government, we have a, a standard way of writing. And so we always work with departments of recreating a vital document. What is the most important information that needs to be known to constituents and what does that need to be put out? 
Um, of course, there's always room to grow. Emergencies um, you know, happen out of the blue, but we do have a close relationship that if there is an emergency, regardless, they will loop our department in um, from the beginning um, and also with support from their own LCA liaisons. In terms of um, uh, metrics of progress, um, I want to also uh, highlight that we are also um, on track to release a dashboard. I, I know that Council Mejia, you and I talked about this as well in the next fiscal year, which will show the data of um, funding that has been put towards interpretation, translation, specifically as well as um, uh, that is a lot of the metrics that we use internally. So whenever a department is uh, requesting interpreters for an event, translations of documents, we're actually able to see all of that in there. So we use that as a metric of seeing the progress from a department, uh, but we're also this upcoming fiscal year, and I see your hand, Councilor, I'm so sorry. Um, this upcoming fiscal year, <laughs> okay. Um, Director Wong, can you uh, wrap it up, please? Yes, um, we also have uh, worked with departments to implement um, other data metrics, and I'm happy to talk more um, after this uh, about those steps as well. Thank you. Councilor did you have a last remark before closing? No, thank you, Councilor um, Anderson. All good. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for that presentation. Language access is so important. And I was a ELL teacher in BPS for many, many of my years. So know how important it is to make sure not just our students, our young kids, but also you know, our parents and caregivers have language access, not just at the school level, but all city departments. Um, so definitely um, happy to see that you're growing. It may be a modest growth. It looks like um, only a little bit of increase from last year's budget, but have a question about, it looks as though like 830,000 of um, your dollars are contractual services. So if you could just touch on what services are being contracted out, how many vendors, is it like a couple big ones or do you have a lot of small vendors? And you know, what do the bulk of the vendors do for that work? If you could clarify that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Um, so in our contracted services line, uh, we do have a contract for our language and interpretation services, which that does take a, a huge chunk of our funding. Uh, we also are going to be working on implementing an ASL and CART contract as well. Uh, we're working closely with Commissioner Mikosh on uh, addressing um, the ASL needs of the city uh, and working with agencies like the Mass Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing uh, um, in this space. Um, there, the contract this year um, is, oh, we also have a contract for our uh, over the phone interpretation and video remote interpretation service. And those are all citywide scale. Um, so that is a bulk of the uh, contracted services that are coming from our office. Um, and I hope I am not misspeaking, but I also believe that under that contracted services, there's also an additional line which has our, um, our grants funding in there as well for that grant project that I was um, mentioning a little bit earlier. Oh, thank you. And as many departments do, it seems like yours is one though that definitely works closely with other departments and that overlap in working together is important, but do you often feel, and I think we've talked about this before at a different hearing, but um, that your department, your office for the language access has to support other departments and maybe we're not funding you enough and kind of keeping track of and I think of your department on the city level I think of like that teacher at a school who then is asked to translate which you know or the secretary who may speak the language of someone and is asked to do something else just because we need it at the moment but then if we look at how do we make sure that we can continue to support your office, do you ever feel that way? And I know you probably always are willing and wanting, but I wanna make sure on our end that we're fully funding your office and making sure you have enough resources and staff so that when other departments are reaching out for your help, that you know you don't feel like it's draining your source resources. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I, at this, at this time, I think we have received the appropriate amount of funding 
um, for the way that we are operating. I also want to emphasize that we are still, uh, you know, growing as a department. You know, we did hire all those uh, new staff in this fiscal year, which was, um, if I'm sure you all can relate um, when it comes to not only bringing in the staff, we want to make sure that we're appropriately giving the time to onboard staff, make sure that we're putting them into projects at a pace that is um, appropriate. Uh, but in terms of our funding, I, I won't say no to any you know more funding that you want to give, but in terms of where we are now and the pace that we're growing, um, I believe that it is appropriate. I do want to emphasize also that the schools has their own budget for language access um, as well, um, as well as um, other agencies like the BPDA and so forth, but I know that you're all aware, aware of that. I'm just making it for um, the record. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Murphy. Council Rao, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Director Wong, for all the work that you guys uh, do here in the city of Boston. It's good to see um, that that your department is growing. Um, I like the initiative, um, the adult literacy initiative d does fall under your, 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 your department, correct? Um, so my understanding, and um, if it's correct, uh, it is being led by the equity cabinet, equity and inclusion cabinet. Um, but if there are questions around that, I'm, I'm happy to make sure that the questions we ask get answered after this. Okay, I'll save my questions on that for um, the equity cabinet. Um, my one question then is around miscellaneous equipment. Um, can you talk to me about you know what we're purchasing for miscellaneous equipment? Of course. Um, this is actually a, a development. During the pandemic times, everyone was virtual. Um, and I think as we've been approaching, I know I, I believe the emergency is being lifted on the 11th, and there are more uh, city events that are happening in person. Uh, what we've been trying to do this fiscal year is, um, is equip ourselves with enough simultaneous interpretation equipment, um, which um, uh, is not only offered to departments, but um, uh, in, uh, if you all need it, we also partner with um, Michelle from the central staff who is also able to leverage the equipment for your events as well. Um, so um, to give you context, the equipment is um, uh, um, expensive, um, is I think um, the most appropriate word that I could find at the moment. Um, but one set, and this is from a quote previous, so don't quote me, it might have changed, um, was around like $15,000 and one set um, supports um, two interpreters for simultaneous interpretation, as well as up to 20 constituents um, um, headsets so that they are able to listen in. And so, as you know, I think the, the little panic that we had was making sure that we step, that we were equipped enough that if tomorrow every single department wanted to have, uh, maybe, maybe that's an overreach, but if there were many departments who wanted to have an in-person event at the same time, we would not be um, we would be able to support the influx of in-person simultaneous interpretation needs. Um, however, we also um, work with the ability to, if we need more equipment, um, contract that with the um, vendor that we have. Um, there is also um, another exciting project that we're working on is a pilot program with iPads. Um, so in addition to, we did purchase a lot of iPads um, to help provide over the uh, video remote interpretation specifically for ASL interpretation. Um, and so that relates back to the program that we're doing with um, the second, first, and third floor departments, but we're also working closely with the Boston Police Departments where we're going to basically do the same model but for the district offices. So our vision is that when you walk into a district office, you'll see the same thing as I described on the second and third floors. You'll see your language access rights, an iPad for um, video remote interpretation, as well as um, the person who is there will be trained to be able to provide you accommodations in your language. We'll also be um, giving iPads to a couple of other departments and we'll have them on a rental. We also have some in our office on uh, um, the ability for departments to use them. Uh, many departments might want to use them, for example, when they have resource fairs, where they might have multilingual staff available to be there, but you know they want to just have the video remote interpretation in case there's somebody who comes up to them in the language that they might not have the capacity in-house to provide. So that is the kind of breakdown, simultaneous interpretation equipment, iPads that will be used for special projects um, as long-term loaners to departments, as well as um, 
iPads that will be in rotation um, for, um, uh, I guess, uh, reserving and using by other departments as well. I love it. I love it. Um, technology advancing uh, language access here in the city of Boston. Um, no further qu uh, questions, uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rell. Councilor Collada, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Director Wong, for your important work. Um, this is the benefit of, of almost going last. Um, my questioning had to do with equipment um, only because you've been e extremely helpful with our office just within the past month when we've held our budget town halls. We, we reached out to you and you provided us with that simultaneous language equipment and we're extremely grateful for that. I'm, I'm happy to hear about the iPads. I think that that's great. Um, I am shocked to hear about the fact that one set is about $15,000 for, for 20 constituents. It, did I get that right? That is correct. Okay, so how many sets, I guess I'm wondering just the, the investment for all of this. Mm -hmm. when, when did we buy these sets? How many sets do you have? What's the shelf life? Are there associated maintenance costs? And when do we anticipate um, needing to buy more of these? Thank you, sorry, I have my notes. <laughs> I'm just trying to pull them up. Um, so it, let me begin with um, the, a uh, question that I want to make sure I answer all of it. So the simultaneous interpretation equipment has a life of around 10 to 15 years. We actually had, I believe, two equipments back from when the program began in around 2018, uh, when it was uh, fully staffed with the first director. Um, and we still have that equipment working. I think the concerns um, that we have seen is what sometimes might happen is once people take it to their event and it's it's to no fault of constituents or anyone at all but sometimes they'll walk out with them um, we had for example at the state of the city um, we kind of walked around um, the whole like stadium and there were folks who were putting the equipment in their bags um, and so we had to like grab all the equipment. I think that's that's mainly the concern that sometimes people walk off with it. Um, however, um, we did purchase nine more sets this fiscal year uh, uh, for simultaneous interpretation equipment. Another, we have looked at um, other types of equipment that is out there. We did go through uh, the appropriate procurement channels to uh, procure this equipment. But another, um, I think, research that we're doing is we have found that the the equipment um, and I oh you, you've used it so you know how it's very simple to use uh, we're also looking at perhaps equipment that could be and I don't we haven't fully done all the research but equipment that could be more discreet I think for our younger folks um, uh, they don't want to walk around with bulky equipment so we're also exploring that possibility of seeing if there's capabilities for any kind of like Bluetooth enabled equipment. Um, but that is a research that is still pending um, and I'm happy to provide updates as, as a year goes on on where we left on that. Awesome, thank you so much. I mean, this isn't, this isn't gonna be you know, a question I think I'm gonna just push out my vision and what I would like to see. Um, Councilor Worrell uh, and I have put forth a, a technical assistance for civic associations um, hearing order. And so, you know, for my goal or my goal in, in my district is to be as welcoming and inclusive, uh, inclusive as we can for our civic associations, because we do put a lot of emphasis on their opinions when it comes to development projects and, and, a, lot, and a lot of that. So it, there are no translation services that are available for them right now. I would love in a perfect world and maybe we can build towards this, right? This is why I'm, I'm bringing this up now but to be able to, to help civic associations and provide them with this simultaneous translation. Right now that doesn't happen. And um, I would just like to, to see more folks um, being welcomed in that way in, in some of these rooms uh, in my district. So just pushing that out there, you don't have to comment on that, but that is, that is a goal of mine. Um, and I hope that we can work towards that. But thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Director, for your work. This is so important. And um, I'm happy to see that you're growing. Thanks. Thank you, Council Coletta. Um, Director uh, Wong, just a couple questions for me and then we'll be able to wrap up if there, are any, if there aren't any more questions. I don't think we have any more time um, beyond this hour to uh, keep going, but um, 
Let me just check. Um, Ethan, do we have anyone signed up for public testimony? We do not. Thanks, Megan. All right. Um, in terms of uh, your breakdown for interpreter services, can you, uh, do you have the information available today or could you provide a breakdown of um, exactly what services are or what languages are requested by, can you break it down by language? Of course, I, I don't have the information, but I can get that to you at whatever time frame you ask for it. Off the top of your head, like who's the top? Um, give me just a second. Let me just, if I can get a second, I can look up really quickly. Thank you. Of course, of course. So Spanish um, is definitely the first. Um, as of now, in terms of citywide um, data of usage, it's Spanish. Hold on, it's loading. I'm so sorry. Um, Spanish, Haitian Creole, Vietnamese, Cape Verdean Creole, Portuguese, Simplified Chinese, Traditional Chinese, Russian, Somali, and French. Sorry, is that in the order of the most requested? Um, yes, most requested languages. So again, Spanish, then Haitian Creole, then Vietnamese, then Cape Verdean Creole. Yep, Portuguese, which is Brazilian Portuguese, simplified Chinese, and this is um, for translation. You only you you provide interpreting services specifically only in Brazilian Portuguese. Oh, um, that is just based on the data here. <laughs> My apologies, not just only in Brazil, but but the way that it falls. In no, Brazil. no, I mean like, do you do you actually provide an interpret an interpreter that's Brazilian? It's just in Brazilian Portuguese. There's Brazilian Portuguese and then there's I'm, I'm joking Portuguese. with you. It's just okay. <laughs> it's the same Portuguese. So I was like, what? Um, cool. All right. So with an accent, right? Um, so CB and then you have Portuguese, but specifically more from Brazilians. Yeah. And sorry, what's the after the Portuguese? Um, and then it would be uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, Russian, Somali, okay. and French. Wait, Russian first, then Somali? Yep. Okay. And then All right. French. And then French. And then can you please break down uh, the demographics or language that your interpreters currently speak? Um, so the in-house or do you mean the vendors? Um, obviously you're contracting out because you need to increase capacity. What's the in-house? So in-house right now, we just have um, Spanish, which will be joining us um, in May, actually in less than 11 days. Um, and for the vendors, I can get you that information, uh, but it is, uh, they can cover not only the top threshold languages of the city and beyond. And so for the top four, Will you, are you, are, do you have positions open for the interpreters, a Vietnamese interpreter, um, a Haitian interpreter, and a Cape Verdean interpreter? So right now we have a position for um, Cape Verdean uh, that is posted. But since and the other, is there, is there a priority or do you have it in the budget to also open a position in Haitian Creole for Haitian interpreter and Vietnamese interpreter? At or will you continue time, to contract? At this time, we are contracting. Do you have any plans to open a position for a Haitian and a Vietnamese interpreter? Um, for this fiscal year, um, it is not in our investments. And then, um, thank you. Um, and so for your upper management, could you break down the demographics in your office, in your department? Um, yes. If you don't have it, if you have it, great. If you don't have it, you can submit it. Okay. And um, uh, specifically, um, what would you like to hear um, from me? I just want to make sure that I get Or you the org chart that you sent. Could you send uh, some sort of graph breakdown of the demographics for your management team or your your org chart? Yep, yep. Um, is it okay if we send that to you after? That's okay. Perfect. 
I always start with a bunch of questions and um, praise later, and I apologize. It's must be a language thing on my end and how I speak, you know what I mean, the other way. But um, I absolutely adore you. You're one of my favorites. I think you are doing amazing jo job. You've taken the SOP department and you have spearheaded, you've completely um, demonstrated executive uh, skills and professionalism. Everyone loves you. Hopefully they all love you. If not, just let me know. I'll beat them up. But um, you are absolutely amazing. I'm just joking for the record in case anyone <laughs> we're on a recorded uh, legal hearing here. Um, but in case any, if, if, I just wanted to tell you that um, I have been following your work and looking at the growth and um, just my interaction with you and understanding your department. You are you are very skilled, and uh, you deserve all the best. And whatever way we can support you, um, we're going to be looking at it, and we may make some recommendations. I don't know what my council colleagues have in mind, but I certainly um, do have a recommendation to open up the position for Haitian and Cape Verdean Creole, uh, Haitian and uh, sorry Vietnamese interpreter as soon as possible. So. Um, Hopefully we're successful with that. And if we're not, it's a, it's a conversation for the next fiscal year. I Thank appreciate you. you and all the work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Director. And uh, without, I don't think anyone else have any questions for your department. So we're going to be um, dismissing you. And as much as we'll miss you, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. All right. Um, next, we have Office of Immigration Advancement, um, uh, Executive Director Monique Wen, and we are uh, happy to have you here. With We're not going to stall you. Um, usually, we have a presentation uh, from our budget analyst, uh, Karishma, and um, I'll be presenting them from now on. Um, but if there are any discrepancies, I think that's where I'll show the presentation. But you have the floor for your presentation. Uh, welcome. Thank you all. Thank you, Chair Fernandez Anderson and counselors for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Monique Nguyen, the Executive Director of the Mayor's Office for Immigrant Advancement, also known as MOYA for short. And I'm eager to tell you about our work and why passing the budget is so critical for us this year. Um, I always start off with my story as the reason why I even came here, but I'll, I'll, my story always starts with my mother's. And I visited my mother, elderly mother, for Christmas, and she was just catching up with me about my new job and what we're doing, especially she's been kept staying on top of the news um, with what's happening in the United States with all the new migrants. And, um, and even her in her golden age, she spent all her time watching the news from, from Canada to see what's happening, to be closer to me. I spoke of the new, new migrants that are coming and seeing their visionary courage and their quest for survival traversing time and terrain and how we should be so lucky to gain more constituents with grit and bravery in addition to the existing 200K immigrant community members here in Boston. I talked about how 311 gets a call from a concerned neighbor, hospital worker, police officer who comes across a new immigrant. Then our city team is dispatched to greet them, assist them with uh, access to state shelter and even hot meals dropped off with them by ONS, and even being spoken to their own language thanks to the work of LCA. My mother, Vietnam, Vietnam War refugee, she paused and looked at me and said, and looked in the distance said, when I was arriving, I didn't understand what was happening. People would just point to me, to sit, I sit. To go there, I go there. And uh, to live here, I stay. I was proud to comfort her and tell her that we don't do that type of thing to new migrants here in Boston. And we treat, we aim to treat immigrants here in Boston with respect and dignity. As we move on from the pandemic, looking back and forward, I am both in awe of what the immigrant community has faced to hold the families and our city together, but what we will face together as we recover from the inequities further worsen over the last three years. Increased isolation and during chronic stress over a period of time has compromised the mental health of immigrant communities. Major concern over age and culture groups. Tools for economic empowerment and recovery is in high demand. Legal access to support immigrants on their immigrant journey in the United States is all time high as a uh, need for as all time high as uh, immigration attorneys are hard to come by and there's a lot of scamming and uh, misrepresentation of uh, people on their immigrant um, a journey. Our budget uh, reflects the resourcing that we will need to partner with the immigrant community to build collective capacity to realize the full potential of what is possible for a brighter future for Boston as we build a city of belonging. 
Um, and I just want to call upon who's the person that's handling the slide deck. I was hoping to have a visual aid support. Um, Ethan is going to get it up for you, um, Director. Thank you. In the meantime, I'll speak to um, Moya's roles in the state. Um, and then what my vision is. As I started, the, when I started as the executive director in August, my vision is to make sure that immigrants are at minimum included in everything our city has to offer in addition to their leadership of shaping and actualizing the future of Boston in this critical year through our department undergoing a community-driven strategic planning process um, for the first time ever. I think it's really important to engage community as um, in the past they have been marginalized and haven't been centered in their leadership. So. Um, what I am requesting in our budget this year is to build out a community organizing leadership development team to ensure that all cultural groups and community, community leaders are in all of the critical visioning and design processes that are stewarded by our department and all major departments this coming year. Everyone from BPDA to the, to the BPL are, are looking to immigrant communities and also constituents to um, center the leadership. We will be aiming to continue all of our existing programming and advocacy efforts, in addition to services and programs we slated to launch to build out the system that we believe will bring equity to our immigrant communities today and immigrants of tomorrow and the coming year. We will continue doing our new migrant uh, arrival support through advocacy and systems building, our Immigrants Leave Boston program, our signature civic engagement program, citizenship and naturalization uh, work through the one day that we have Citizenship Day, which is our big, um, event we're known for, what we want to make sure this year, and this, what we did last year and this year is that we work with community-based organizations for them to also empower people to pursue, pursue citizenship. Um, we will be doing continuing immigrant entrepreneurship and workforce development pathways for the community, um, building out legal access, um, constituent, constituent services to ensure that the field has enough capacity for legal representation for immigrants who are applying from everything from asylum to TPS and other forms of immigration related pathways. Excuse me a moment, um, Monique. Um, Ethan, do we, are we able to get the presentation up or? Hi, Counselor. I don't believe it was shared with me. I was just looking for it here. Okay. Um, Director, are you? Yeah, am I able to do it? Do or we share or should, do you want to just keep going? Um, um, we can keep we have we have it. Okay, great. Okay. We'll yeah, no, director, you should be able to screen share it if, if you'd like. Um, if not, we we would be able to do it if I had it. Yeah, can you do it? Because it's not it's not letting me do so. Um, should I screen share? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, if you had the presentation, I think that would be fine, Counselor. Okay. And it's just a visual companion, so it's the things I speak to. Um, um, no problem. Actually, uh, sorry, I... Yeah, I think te uh, technology, I think there's something restricting Yeah. This. Okay, I can speak to the, the points. Um, we're continuing to do our, our uh, Dreamers Fellowship, but this year we're expanding it to all immigrant youth and also focusing that focusing on the Dreamers Fellowship to build to fight for tuition equity, which is exciting for us this year on the state level. And the big project that we're, that's reaching launch this year is thanks to all of your support and leadership from last year's uh, investments um, is our ARPA, uh, COVID-19 economic relief initiative that is serving up to 200 Boston immigrant families with cash assistance for a year to help people from recover from the, from the pandemics. And thank you again for your support. And we're, we're going to be launching that um, uh, in the summer, in the fall. And our major accomplishments um, for the past year is securing the ARPA funding and then moving into uh, major phases to um, launch the ARPA project, which is going to be the major focus of our, uh, of our department this year for a pilot. 
Um, but we will make sure that this pilot is going to be um, having a lot of uh, integration with all of our other uh, programs and services. So it's it's a well-oiled old machine to serve um, serve the immigrant community. Uh, we will be continuing our mental health uh, grants and working with the community to bring, bring mental health and well-being to immigrants in Boston, destigmatizing mental health challenges and encouraging non-clinical, culturally and linguistically sensitive practices as a form of therapy. And uh, Moya is committing to 160,000 in grants to immigrant serving groups that incorporate wellness practices in their programming. And we'll be working with um, the immigrant community to bring legal access. And that means that we're going to train up and give access to organizations who want to be uh, foundations um, for accessing legal access, uh, legal uh, representation for immigrant community by getting them BIA accredited by the Department of Justice and being able to hire um, attorneys and paralegals to help with the immigrant community. And, um, and the, another accomplishment this year is that we have the largest citizenship uh, day that we've ever had serving up to 200 Boston residents this past April. And we're really excited about where that's going to go. And we expanded the Dreamers Fellowship this year as well. Um, one of the things that we've been working on is the increase of migrants in the Boston area. And we wanna thank the counselors for here, calling the hearing in December and inviting me to testify. As the city council is aware, there's been an increase in new migrants in the United States and, and being here in Boston. Many are fleeing unimaginable violence on, on all levels and share the challenges and responsibility to address the humanitarian crisis. We would like to thank our city council uh, partners and city hall co-workers from across several departments for their dedication and coordination. We'd also like to thank nonprofits and hospitals for their tireless frontline efforts and the state for stepping up and you counselors for all your attention and advocacy. And um, our proposed investments for the coming year is largely focused on personnel um, as we are trying to build out a team for further community engagement and uh, leadership development. We are asking for full, four full-time employees, but mostly through redistributing our grant lines and um, not asking for addition, not much addition in, in our existing budget, but redistributing our existing resources to be able to cover full-time staff so we can bring it in-house instead of contracting out. Um, thank you. Thank you, Constance, for your time and support for immigrant communities. I hope you'll pass this budget for equitable, ac equitable access and opportunity for all of our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to Monique for your presentation, for your leadership and in, in, in the work your team is doing, the important work your team is doing. I was with your team for Project Citizenship. I believe it was at the Reggie Lewis Center um, several weeks ago, and I know that was an outstanding and coordinated event. So I want to acknowledge the important work you're doing on different fronts. Um, so, Monique, I, I, I listening to the different presentations, I know um, Krista McCosh is going to be speaking soon, and and uh, Commissioner Santiago, but 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 also with with immigration communication access. Um, but it's isn't it important that all all departments work together, um, coordinate with each other, be on the same page? Because what impacts one department is really impacting another department in. It's the coordination of services that's also key. So I, I know you're doing that, Monique, but why don't you give us an, give us an example of how that communication benefits um, residents of Boston? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's definitely one of my biggest um, work, work areas this year is consolidating um, coordination so that we can best serve constituents. Because one thing constituents have a hard time is that they always get uh, steered around all these services from nonprofits to city departments and just kind of been led to like dead ends a lot of time. I'm just hoping um, through the mayor's priority of making sure that we deliver um, great uh, services is that we're building out a, a case management uh, platform for that 
our department can become more efficient and effective in and uh, secure in the way we handle and support constituents in their needs, but also coordinate with other city departments so that there's this one uh, place where we can all look at how we can collectively support. But right now we're, we're doing that uh, really great through um, all the communication channels that we can use from email to, um, to making a phone call. So we're hoping through technology, we're able to become more uh, effective and efficient, but it's really important. And I think it's a critical concern and critical um, priority for the administration and also my department to deliver that. Thank you, Monique. I know one department that's not here that also plays a critical role in the city is Office of Food Access as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't have any further questions. Just want to um, thank you and your team for the important work you are doing. Boston's an immigrant city. We're proud of our immigrant roots here and immigrants helped build our city and helped build our country. So I want to say thank you to your team, Monique, and uh, thanks for the important work you're doing. Thank you for your ongoing support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the Executive Director Nguyen for um, the work that you do. And as referenced uh, earlier on, the Boston City Council has always taken a lead role with respect to our new Bostonians and immigrant advancement. So thank you for the work that you do and uh, look forward to the continued partnership. And like I mentioned to um, Executive Director Wong, if there's things uh, that you need that uh, to help make your department run, uh, more effectively and more efficiently than uh, now's the time during the budget process to uh, let us uh, as the legislative branch of city government know uh, where we can be more helpful and uh, whether that's in personnel or it's taking advantage of uh, technology um, and or other services so our hope is that you know we continue to do the work ourselves as opposed to having to contract it out but uh, some situations lend themselves to, to that but uh, we're here to be supportive uh, we understand the importance to echo the comments of council president flynn uh, that we're a city founded on the backs of, of immigrants and that's important that we make sure that they know that uh, they're always welcome and that we're going to do the very best we can to make sure that they have the resources to uh, to sustain themselves and their families to to make a vital uh, make a vital contribution to our cities thank you executive director appreciate your work that you do thank you thank you council flaherty council braden you have the floor Okay, we'll go to Council Lujan and circle back. Thank you, Council Fernand Jenison, um, and thank you, Director Nguyen, for uh, your presentation and for your advocacy and also for your story, which uh, really guides the work that you do. Um, obviously, my office um, as a chair of uh, uh, civil rights and immigrant advancement care deeply about this work, and as the daughter of Haitian immigrants, um, Haitians are uh, the biggest migrant group of new arrivals that we have coming into the city of Boston. And so uh, from the beginning, we've been advocating for more funds, not just for uh, uh, new arrivals, but also with Project Citizenship. We were happy to work alongside Council Orrell. And so really glad to hear and to see um, how that has been expanding and consider us a partner um, if, if, sorry if you hear the train in the background, um, if uh, we want to continue uh, to grow that with our with our great nonprofit partner that that really spearheads that effort. Um, I have uh, some uh, questions about some line items on the budget. Um, uh, on page three hundred, it says that like there are some projections, um, and I'm curious about how the projections are made. Um, for under the goal that says support city, state, and federal agencies to more equitably serve our immigrant residents. The performance measures has the number of equity oriented recommendations made to city, state, federal agencies. Can you can you detail what that means, equity oriented recommendations, and then explain why the projection increases um, the amount it does? Yes, most of our advocacy efforts and um, uh, particularly working um, with the state and federal to maximize what they or their role roles are poised to do, for example, with the new migrants. 
um, is that on the state level, the state is, is responsible for family-based shelter. So most of our, our response has been also responding to people on the ground, but also um, doing advocacy work with um, lots of meetings and lots of um, letters and lots of um, mobilizing the community to be able to, um, to advocate to the state on the federal level for the new arrivals um, that are coming to the country. So those are the metrics that we use. We kind of use it as like actions that we take is of how much effort that we put into to um to those type of um, campaigns yeah. okay um and, and so similarly versus this year and next year um given like there's an increase in the number of new migrants it, it the increase in the number of constituents assisted doesn't seem to go up as much as we see new arrivals coming right it's like right that's seven thousand five hundred and twelve and the projection is 8,000. But given that we're seeing more and more new migrants coming, why isn't that projection higher? Yeah, it's been really hard to do the analytics to forecast a number that's that's not too like overreaching, but then also a modest. So we just base it on the rate of the ones that have been engaging through our department. Um, but if you have further information that uh, can give us better data about how we can um, have that number, how it's centralized in Boston, then I, I'm, I'm open to help helping that number inform our decision to expand the need of that. But we just based on, on our existing data that we've had in, in our history, yeah. If we do see the number increase, the number of contacts or the number of people, is there capacity within Moya to address that? I would say the the four full-time employees that I have, I, I project that would be able to support us if we increased our capacity 20% to address the need. But if we think 50 or above, I would need additional personnel or uh, contracting lines or we'll, we can also work within our existing budget to be strategic about how do we uh, regret to community-based organizations to support us and also hire contractors as well. Yeah, I want to echo something Councillor uh, Flaherty um, stated, right? We want to support the office as much as possible and to do that via the budget. I get calls every single day from our migrant communities and I want to make sure that our budget reflects what you stated and what our colleagues have stated is um, a need to address these issues. And I know that a, a good chunk of it when it comes to family placement is uh, is uh, uh, is within the purview of the state, and so the role of Moya and the, and others is to be in community. I'm in communications with the state every day, you know, to make sure that they're doing what they should regarding family-based placement of housing. Housing being the number one issue, like where are we able to, you know. Uh, shelter folks, new arrivals, but we also have individuals who are arriving um, and other needs. Um, and I'm wondering how can the office, uh, you know, where the state doesn't have jurisdiction, how can we really sort of grow the work that we're doing? Yeah. Yeah, like I think, um, the, especially the resources that you stewarded for us through the um, housing, for example, we've been um, making sure that that is like our very extreme fund that we protect, but making sure that the federal government, the state, are use existing resources that do happen, uh, that they do have. That wasn't even a lot of money, right? That yeah. like, that was 1.1 1. 1 million, which is like a little drop in a, a chair is my time up. Oh. Anyways, can she, can she finish the answer? Chair, is that okay? No. Oh. Uh, of course it is. Uh, Council uh, Lujan, do you want to just add your final question? No, 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 no. Just saying, like the money that we were able to secure via ARPA is like a a penny compared to the need that we see. So just want to, if there's more that we can allocate via this budget, I'm ready to do that. And I know that my colleagues are ready to stand with me to do that. Yesterday we recognized Haitian Heritage Month. We know that there are new migrants coming at, um, every day and we can walk and chew gum. It's not a zero sum game. We can care for those who have just arrived and those who have been here for decades and generations. And if we can do so operationally through this budget in ways where the state doesn't have jurisdiction, um, I know that we would be thrilled to help you and, and think about how we can do that as we realize, you know, everyone's calling and talking about the folks who are sleeping on Boston Medical Center, which is at, on the floor of Boston Medical Center, which is not a new phenomenon. It's something that we have been elevating since last year. Um, and so if we can use this budget to do to address some of these issues, uh, I'd like us to do that. And so sorry, you were talking. 
No, I, I appreciate that that support and um, and the, truthfully, the numbers that we we sp uh, we forecast is were based on information that we had at that time when we did the budget, and also the numbers has increased a lot in the few uh, the last uh, few weeks, uh, and the budget are, was already set. So I, I do um, I do echo that we need to meet the scale of the of what's needed for the future, and um, I would love to continue connection with you guys to think about a number that's more reflective of what we'll need. But I feel confidently that the budget that we do have, we can work with, because particularly with the grants and the contracting lines that we have with moving money around, we can we can um, meet them moment. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you um, for thank you for indulging me in my time uh, going over. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I always appreciate your leadership and continue advocacy for immigrant. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Lujan and Director. Uh, Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I guess, you know, I wanted to just first uplift the important work of immigrant advancement and um, the role that you have played um, in advocacy, not just during COVID, but just overall, just making sure the quality of life for our recent arrivals and those who are here. Um, so really do appreciate your work. So thank you for that. Um, curious, most of my questions are going to be around um, the, how we can support, you mentioned the DREAMers um, and the workforce development initiatives, and I'm curious in terms of uh, strengthening that. You know, we've been working with Nikki, the Boston Foundation, and other groups um, to help support these young people who are going to be aging out of DACA, right, that are going to um, find themselves in a situation where they're not going to be able to qualify and, and have support. So can you just talk to us a little bit about what you plan to do to provide that safety net for some of these young people? Yes, I believe like the everything from our economic recovery project for cash assistance to also doing uh, work across other city departments with the workforce pathways that we have through the worker empowerment cabinet. There's a lot of opportunities for all, uh, all immigrants and all constituents <laughs> Get workforce training and pathways to different careers that they that they dream of or even think about that they'll need for stability for their families. Um, so I'm hoping with the additional staff that I have, we can do engagement of people to be stewarded into those pathways that could create a lot of economic opportunity for them. Um, yeah, and something um, I've been uh, thinking a lot about is the, the lifespan of, of, of immigrants, particularly from uh, like, the, the baby age to even being a youth and also becoming an adult, an adult worker. So I'm hoping um, through our administration that we can provide um, for everyone, depend, regardless of where they are with their immigration status, to their, their age group. Um, so I'm going to be doing a lot of engagement and organizing work um, to exit programs. Yeah. Thank you, Monique. Just because I know that um, concert, the chair's hand is going to go up quickly, and I want to make sure that I get in a few more questions. but. I'm still unclear in terms of just in terms of dollar wise, how, how many more dollars are we going to invest uh, mm -hmm. to support the dreamers in, in the workforce development initiative? Yeah, so the uh, I'm not asking for additional funds this year. We have a pretty robust um, budget, but we are moving things around in, in within our existing lines to be able to invest in expanding the program. So. Okay. Um, Okay. So yes, yeah, so uh, two thirds of our budget is regranting and working with the community. So we'll be expanding that line to be for us to be able to serve more, uh, more immigrant youth, but then also with other city departments to also step up and support and expand their work in in pathwaying um, their opportunities for immigrant youth, regardless of their status. So we're working with other city departments to make sure there's inclusion of them. Um, every everything from employment opportunity to the. Um, to the YEO <laughs> department, yes. Thank you, I, and the last thing, because I want to be super mindful of time. Um, you know, I always say that the city is resource rich, but coordination poor. Mm -mm. I have a hard time um, interacting with other departments. So can you just talk to us a little bit about how Moya interfaces with different departments, whether it's housing, whether it's, um, and what investments are being made to streamline the process? for those who are recently arriving to the city of Boston and how we acclimate them to the city and connect them to the support services that they need. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. Being a, even a constituent for, in Boston for a long time, I've also experienced pre previous, I, mean, I experienced from pre previous administrations how I felt like there was a not, lack of coordination in serving me. But under during my time under this administration, I've been seeing really great collaboration and coordination across city departments. And um, thanks to technology and also uh, everyone being so mission driven to support Boston, um, I haven't experienced and we were getting better every day as a new administration. Um, and then for how we're orienting new uh, migrants, it's been, we've been really centering like a humane and dignified response, imagining the new arrivals as if we're a family member that's coming from safety and then how do we even greet them? So um, 311 takes a call, for example, and then it triggers this uh, working group that we all have every from cabinet heads to even frontline staff from ONS. And then everyone has their role into how to respond. So. Um, ONS actually, depending on the neighborhood, go greets or cultural heritage. They they go greet the new rival, um, and then find out more with whoever is their caseworker or whoever interface with them on what their situation is. Um, move them quickly with uh, with the Office of Housing Stability to sort out uh, access to emergency shelter, and also coordinating with the state to find spaces for them. And then we uh, Moya also works in supporting the integration of them after they stabilize from from getting. Uh, emergency housing. So we're hoping to, that we'll provide them from A to Z support. Yeah, we, and we're we centering a human response to this. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Chair. I will, um, I know I, have, I don't have any more time left, so thank you. Uh, Kasumi, did you have a final question? No, 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 no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for your advocacy and I appreciate it. As I mean, as we know, we're, we're a city of immigrants. It's what makes us strong. So I am um, happy to see that we're growing the office a little, but it does definitely seems like it's a, it's a modest increase. So um, just questions around, and I know my previous colleagues asked them, but making sure that you are fully funded and are able to do you know, the work that's needed. Are there any areas that you feel that you could use more support in or certain um, cases for our immigrants that you feel as so, though, you know, mm. you could, um, yes. So go ahead. Yeah, something I want to name about our, our office growing as, as a manager, that's like, it's also, I want to grow to that's, uh, that's sustainable for our management mm -hmm. structure as well. And also yeah. reflective of how hard it's also been um, being able to hire um, at uh, like quickly enough. So I feel like the number that we have is a, is a modest, but also reasonable number for what, what we forecasted during that time. But I will take into consider in all consideration of all your advocacy of expanding it if needed. So, but at this point- uh, I, No, uh, I appreciate that. Like we had new um, departments last year and doubling them, even though we know it's a great department, it could almost hurt them right in the long run. Right. So I appreciate that you know that. And uh, just make sure to lean on us because um, all of us definitely want to make sure this work goes forward. Um, and kind of like the language access, um, a lot of it, it looks like 1.8 million is in contractual services. 56% um, of the department's functions are being contracted out. If you could just touch on um, like, which services they are and how many vendors, mm -hmm. you know, is it a, a few? Do we out to a lot of people uh, for that bulk of that work? If you could um, just speak to that, that'd be helpful. It, it ranges from very small vendors for, for food catering to uh, large vendors that are for evaluators for our huge upper projects. So I can get you the exact number of how many vendors and the breakdown of what they are, but I can tell, speak to is not like a high volume, but it's, it's, um, it's mostly from everything that we'll need to pull off events to even pulling off a big project that we could not ever sustain in-house that or the one time, um, uh, one time projects. So um, our biggest one, for example, is like uh, the evaluator for our opera project, which is a um, like a couple hundred, like a couple of thousand, hundred thousand, you know, like- Yeah, it's a big one. Yeah, it's a big one. Is there any um, like, Cliff funding that we talk about in the school department too, where it's opera, so it won't be there, and that we're gonna like come back next year and wanna put it into the regular budget. Are there any concerns there? And not at this time, but I'll have to reflect more and get back to you. But that's a good question. I haven't thought about that. 
Right, because, you know, during these upper years where we allocated a lot last year and this year they're being spent out, but then I just want to make sure in the, you know, two, three years out that it's not something that was you know, really needed and supporting our immigrant families and then we didn't put it into the, you know, the regular budget. So yeah. definitely reach out if you see that that's coming so we can be strong advocates so I can support that. Yeah, my hopes are with, particularly with the one-time ARPA project, that it's a pilot and it becomes a successful project in turning the tide in economic recovery for for uh, for immigrants. So, uh, mm -hmm. fingers crossed that it's uh, it gets executed well and, and really res uh, community is really responsive to it. That we might be able to think about how we can expand it for the city, um, for other constituent groups as well. So, we'll be in communication about that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Murphy. Council Murphy, can you clarify the question for the record uh, so that the director can submit it through my email? Yep, it's any funding. Um, she mentioned one of the big contracted ones this year is through OPER, an OPER project. So we allocated money to this department through OPER funds and making sure that are any of the programs are going to need to be sustained past this year. So when the OPER funds run out, where is this money going to come from? Or is it a program or project that's just going to be a one-time thing? And I think, Monique, you were saying that if it's successful, we're going to want to continue it and grow it. So making sure that we get it into the budget for the next year, if it's something we want to continue to support. Oftentimes, you know, if our residents have this resource, whatever it is, and then all of a sudden it's gone and we have to explain that, well, that was just a one-time opportunity. So to make sure we're putting our money, you know, the value into the budget next year to make sure that any projects are going to go forward and not die once opera is gone. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Um, you. You're very welcome. Councilor Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Derek and Eugen. Um, I appreciate all the work that you um, are doing here in the city of Boston. Just to echo some of uh, my colleagues is uh, just want to make sure that we're supporting our migrants and the investment and support services are there uh, to support them. And I understand that you, you are doing, but just making sure that we have the capacity and the um, investments to take on the demand that's that's coming into the city of Boston. Um, and then also um, echoing uh, what Council Mejia said, I love the fact that you're expanding um, the Dreamers uh, Fellowship Program, um, and we'll love to just continue as, as you know each year goes on every couple of years that, that we continue to expand that program. Um, but along those lines, the Immigrant Professional uh, Fellowship. And one thing that I realized that many immigrants um, who complete school in, in their country of origin uh, do not receive credit for their education, um, even when they hold professional degrees uh, to practice law and medicine. And um, what efforts is the department making sure uh, that new arrivals receive credit and acknowledgement for their education? Um, and do we have resources to help ensure all new immigrants have access to these programs? Because uh, I saw on the website under the Immigrant Professional Fellowship that you have to have a um, high school um, degree, right? And I'm not sure if that means a US high school degree or um, any high school degree. So just kind of wanted to um, hear hear how we're supporting that and how we're taking into consideration the work that they have done in the country of origin. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the current program focuses, focuses mostly on healthcare. And there's, is there any ability or interest in expanding this program to new industry? Um, and which ones do you think will make a good fit? Hmm. Yes. Um, so in regards to max, like the past credit and education, yes, that's something that I feel is such a mis missed opportunity for a lot of municipalities and also the country whenever we don't maximize the potential of immigrants or even just constituents here in Boston of what they can, can offer. So um, through, we learned a lot through partnering with um, for the Immigrant um, Professionals Fellowship Program. And then um, I'm learning a lot that's already offered through the city and how they can, uh, how we can be better our efforts and making sure that we have a pathway for people to have a full assessment of what they desired and dreamed to do, but also an audit of what they have already been done to honor that adequately. Uh, the Office for Worker Empowerment has a great tool and a success center and hoping that we can maximize and work with them closely to refine that to better serve immigrants as well. And then, 
Also, um, other industries, uh, yes, health, I think, I believe healthcare is, uh, is a key industry, but also I believe um, through the city, there's a lot of focus on life sciences and also green, the new Green Deal, like infrastructure building. So like thinking about trades, um, even helping jobs and helping running the city and even um, helping um, build new ecosystems for life sciences industry. So I think there's a lot of great opportunity um, to um, lead a lot of uh, marginalized groups into uh, sustainable jobs for the future. And I'm really excited about how we can steward that for it, for them. Yeah. Thank you for that answer, but nothing currently like in place or any pilot program or any thoughts around how, how do we acknowledge? Um, I guess I just need a little bit more clarity on that part. The yeah, part. yeah, we, we have the Immigrant Professionals uh, Fellowship, but now we're integrating it in our, our integration program. So um, it's just through our, our typical work and the African Vision Act work is already connect, is connected with workforce development. So I believe that our role is making sure that a lot of things that we've learned that are effective are going to become part of the city infrastructure. So if we can pilot as a program in our department, like like you saw through our immigrant professionals, but then how do we integrate that in and make it accessible for everybody? So um, there isn't like a, a program to invest in. It's already part of like our infrastructure, I would say. So um, I, I think that I, hopefully that's helpful. But um, yeah, we're just continuing to do that work the immigrant professionals program, but be more integrated systems wise for it. All right, thank you. Uh, no, no further que uh, questions, Councilor Anderson. Thank you, Councilor Wuerl. Councilor Paletta, you have the floor. Councilor Coletta, if you will circle back to you. Apologies, I, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much and thank you Chair and, and thank you Edie Wynn. Uh, it's been incredible to see your leadership and be in deep partnership with you and providing a, a coordinated and dignified response in city services for migrant families, many of whom have, have come to East Boston and our police stations and our, our health center. So just appreciate you for, for that and, and working with us to fill some of the service gaps that, that we identified pretty early on. Um, and you've spoken at length in your opening remarks and in answering questions from my colleagues about this and how your office is, um, is truly being integrated in the response. So I do intend to bring up the need for more funding for housing during MOH and, and other hearings. So I'll save that uh, for, for those hearings, but I do recognize, you know, we're a city where nearly 30% of our residents are foreign born. And so it's really important to have strong advocacy for our undocumented neighbors across the city. And, in my district in East Boston in particular, it's a community with a rich immigrant history and that diversity is, is our strength. And so I, in order to foster this pipeline of leadership and, and empower voices, I was, um, I was proud to push forth the amendment last year that allowed for an additional $100,000 for the um, Immigrants Lead Boston program, which is a beautiful program. I really enjoyed going to the graduation and, and seeing folks go through it. Um, I'm, my question is centered around this, and it's, it's my only question for right now, Chair, but are we at the same level of, of funding for last year? I think we were able to expand it to 20 additional folks, um, and, and if not, uh, why not? Thank you. Yes, so thank you so much for your advocacy efforts to do Immigrants Lead Boston, but um, um, advocating for uh, a cohort that's Spanish speaking, and I do believe that's so important, and I'm committed to language justice too. And that was something that, um, um, that I found when I came into the department that you had such a uh, deep desire for this. And I also have that deep desire as well, but we didn't have the staffing in place to be able to fully um, implement a uh, whole Immigrants Lead Boston program uh, cohort with um, in, in Spanish with the, the, the skills and the language that we needed. So I realized too, this is also an opportunity for us to train up existing Immigrant Leads Boston alumni for them to develop the leadership of others. So we can multiply the efforts and how many people we can grow in the future. So the money that you advocated for, we actually applied it to doing Immigrant Lease Boston Lab, where we're actually recruiting people that would be able to facilitate the next cohort, um, but training them up to be those trainers. So it's a training of trainer models, uh, which you might be familiar with in community organizing. And I'm hoping this could be actually a pathway for us to scale to the, to the need of uh, having immigrants leave Boston's like hundreds over the years because of trading up other leaders that we brought into the program. 
I'm hoping that this fills it. So I just had to take a pause to think about how do we sustainably do this um, ongoing, but also for Spanish, for Haitian Creole, for uh, Chinese speaking um, dialects as well, and Cape Verdean, for example. But I realized we, it's a missed opportunity for us to not develop the leadership of the people we already invested in. So that's what I was able to do to pivot. And I'm hoping that I can actually do more than, than 20 in the coming year for Spanish um, ILB and other languages as well. That's excellent. I really appreciate that. And, and, and I didn't know that. And you're definitely taking a page from the community organizing book, which I know you come from and you have deep roots in. Um, so just appreciate that. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, again, bringing up the civic associations thing, the, that, that was my goal, where there is a lot of centralized power mm -hmm. in some of these rooms. And so training folks to um, not only lobby us and, and be advocates to their city government, but with their own neighbors. And I do think that this is a, a, a fantastic vehicle for folks to build up their leadership skills and their advocacy skills um, with their own neighbors. So thank you for that. And um, thank you for all the work you do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for your advocacy for that fund. Thank you, Council Coletta. Um, uh, Director um, Nguyen, I wanted to ask you just a couple of questions. Um, just going back to what Council Mejia was asking you, um, specifically or asking in general in terms of um, metrics, um, I guess I wanted to compare uh, both your staff to what the need is in Boston. I know that uh, a few months ago I had asked the same thing and looking for that information to understand if you feel, how you feel you are properly um, addressing the needs of demographic, of the immigrant demographics in Boston. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, what I'm really proud of is that our department um, is very diverse. I think one of the most diverse departments in, in the city. And there's not one, no two team members that, are, that's, that have all the same languages and from the same country. So I'm really um, thinking that we are gonna continue growing to reflect the, the needs of the constituents. But one thing I wanna uh, honor too about our department is that we're not um, uh, a major frontline department like a lot of departments that that meet constituents on the day to day. And I think that um, those, um, I actually, even though I speak Vietnamese, I, I really use it myself, but thanks to the work of else language access communications, if someone walked in the department, another language, we can utilize those skills as those tools to uh, activate language justice. So um, I just wanna name that and I, I think, um, uh, just to speak to some demographic, did you want to learn some about demographics of our staff breakdown, or is that something that uh, was uh, presented in the to the city council already? So I know that was something that was a topic. Oh, you're mute. I'm sorry. That was on mute. Um, yeah. So it was provided last year, but every year we ask, right? Mm -hmm and every year there's an update. So yeah. I yeah. asked, so I guess I'm look. I'm sorry. So did you wanna, so would you like the, the, the breakdown of our demographic? No, I like to ask the question. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if the demographics of your staff today reflects the demographic of the immigrant population in Boston. Yeah, I was reflective. I feel like we need more. I mean, if we had to grow to the scale of representing all communities, we'll probably need like, like 50 staff, you know, if we look the Boston's very diverse in that way. But um, yeah, but right now, uh, it's, it's reflective of, of, of some Bostonians, but not not all. So I'm hoping one day that we'll be big enough to rep be reflective of everybody, but we're incredibly diverse in Boston. There were several questions that I sent out in RFI, and I understand that you presented a, a beautiful presentation. I really appreciated how you started um, your presentation today with the story of your own um, family, and um, which is very close to near to our hearts, since a lot of us are either first generation or second for my colleagues, um, some of my colleagues. Um, I guess if you could please uh, send me the responses to the RFIs that I've submitted. Okay. And I've been looking to work with the um, IGR and administration to, um, there are certain, certain departments that did not get the information, the RFI in time. And so I understand that you may need more time to respond to those questions. If you can, um, 
please uh, re answer to your best of your ability uh, thoroughly and send it, submit it to me. That'd be nice. Thank you. Um, I guess in terms of measurements, um, just overall monitoring your progress and understanding what exactly the needs are for the immigrant population in Boston. Um, to Council Lujan's point, there's a growing demographic of the Haitian migrants and others. Um, and so how are you projecting the need and how do you know that you have, you mentioned that the budget that you have today, um, you feel is sufficient to addressing that need. Um, have you, your office in particular, done any research or um, assessment in terms of what that demographic, growing demographic is and what the need will be? Mm -hmm. Yes, we've been tracking and doing a lot of research from uh, existing data sets and also from like just hearing from news and doing some forecasting um, based on the data that we got from other states and what we're hearing from internationally. I think most of like the, the growing population that we'll, uh, we'll get in Boston area will be people who are beneficiaries of the Cuban, Haitian, Nicaraguan, Venezuelan um, asylum program. So um, parole, parole, parole program. So um, being that Boston is also has uh, the third largest Haitian community in Boston, a lot of community members come to areas where there's social ties. So we anticipate a lot of the growing uh, community members will be um, Haitian and Latinx folks. Do you, do you have someone that is Haitian in your department? Not this time, but I would love to ha have additional team members. Um, so I'm hoping with the new hires, the position, we have one position open right now for policy advisor, if you can help us uh, find good folks for that. And then we also have the four positions that we're asking the city, uh, the council for and, and the mayor for. So hoping we will have a Haitian uh, Creole speaking representative in our staff in the future. What are the different uh, positions that you're looking for again? Um, so policy advisors open right now, then we will have um, three community engagement folks, uh, one communica communications uh, associate and one uh, special projects manager. And this whole team will be working together to spend their time on new arrivals planning and response, but also doing general community, community engagement and organizing work. Awesome. There was um, a question about, I guess, Maybe this is already answered um, in terms of your contractual um, uh, amounts. The, there was a 58%, 58.7% of um, your FY24 budget under contractual services. Not sure um, what they are um, and have 15,000 for current charges, but um, I'm not sure what they are either. Um, could you, could you explain? Um... Other current charges. Oh, you're speaking to the contracted services? Yes. So our contracted services, um, services range from big things like our administrator for administrator and also evaluator for our upper project, which is from 100K to 1.2 million, 1.2, no, 2.9 million for our upper project where the administrator the cash assistance from everything from small things from catering a citizenship day event. So it's a range of what's in under the contracted services line. Events um, and projects mostly? Events and projects, yes. Yeah, and photographers, um, videographers, random things like that, that we don't have um, staffing uh, capacity for or the skill set that's needed for an ongoing basis. So we contract out. And for uh, um, other current charges, give me a second. I believe that's the other current charges, like other unanticipated um, costs that we that we um, we had for just reopening um, after the pandemic, particularly from staffing and being in person again. So there were things that we just didn't anticipate that that were rolled into that other current charges, from telecommunications to um, to materials for in person or even office supplies for growing staff, but also being in person again. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have any other questions, um, uh, Director. Thank you so very much for your amazing work. Um, we appreciate you and um, we'll look forward to inviting you to work in session if necessary, if we have further questions, just if in case uh, any counselors are thinking about um, suggesting amendments. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and at this time, if anyone has any last questions, for Director uh, Nguyen, it's 
this is the your last chance. All right. Um, thank you so much. Oh, uh, Ash Tassel, Tassel Ashley here has a question. After and yeah. Aha! You thought you were gonna leave. I don't know. I have a follow-up question. I'm like waiting for you. I'm like, where's she at? <laughs> well, that's right, because I'm going to bring you a little bit of heat. Um, no, okay. I, mm -hmm. I'm being really generous and gracious with, um, with you all, um, because I am an immigrant, and I love the work that you do, so I really want to be supportive. I, I'm curious, you know, Councilor Coletta was talking about um, the additional support around the civic engagement piece, and that's also something that's near and dear with me. I'm curious about um, some funding specifically not just within um, civic association meetings, um, but uh, I'm also looking at the role that you all can play in helping to support some of our BPS families who are mm -hmm. navigating. Um, and because I want to go back to the coordination poor situation and just kind of like, how are you interfacing with BPS parents um, as they navigate um, the system and what kind of supports are you able to give them? And then last, we get, um, immigrants that call our office day in and day out. Um, and oftentimes we either had to walk them directly to your office or, you know, have gone through a number of different hoops just to get to you all. Um, but at least that's what they reported to us. So I'm just curious, kind of like in terms of ease with um, connecting our um, constituents directly to your office, what, what are some of the things that you're going to be making investments on so that it's easier for folks to actually connect with you all? So those are two questions. Yeah, so I'll answer the connection first. Um, yeah, I'm hoping with more more um, outreach that they have a better understanding of how to connect us efficiently. I, I mean, I feel like um, I've, uh, this is good feedback for me, and I can talk to the team about this. But uh, our team makes sure that we're we always have a team member in the office every day. So uh, apologies to the constituents who didn't meet someone in the office. We feel like we're really responsive, but we have an email that goes to all our whole team, the immigrant advancement at Boston gov and then also our office but then uh, we're also directing uh, all constituents who have questions or needing to connect with city departments to 311 and 311 can can connect to us and follow up to make sure that we connect with us to Monique, i just want to like put a pin on that one real quick because a lot of our recent arrivals either don't know how to read and write um mm -hmm. sometimes have that interrupted education and some may not have access to apparatuses like what you just mentioned in terms of the app or you know all of that sort of stuff. So outside of just technology, what are some of the other ways we're able to connect with recent arrivals? Um, yeah, recent arrivals right now, um, we whoever the the first frontline people who interact with them, oftentimes, yes, that's something we're hoping to do more outreach of uh, multilingually for people to know how to reach us. But right now, um, uh, with the you know city departments or any constituent in the neighborhood that knows of us just reaches us through there but I'm hoping to change that in the future with our organizers said I'm hoping that you will prove um, that we can get more awareness about how to connect with us more effectively but I encourage people to leave uh, if they for any reason they call us and their their our phone line is busy leave a voicemail we always return calls within 24 hours if it's not but if it's urgent then we definitely respond quicker and if it's emergency of course 911 um and then um yeah that's something that we pride ourselves with them uh, thank you for that feedback thank you chair thank you for the second round thank you monique for all your hard work thank you so much uh, councilor mejia um uh, Director Nguyen, how are you working with, uh, or do, are you able to work with ONS in terms of, I know their responsibility is community outreach and engagement, so um, uh, hopefully looking forward to seeing some of that collaboration. Oh yes, we work together very closely right now. I'm actually, my, I'm hoping my team or team members and their team are like one big team together to support the cultural community. Um, so I see us as like a hybrid team working across departments to do outreach and engagement for sure. Yeah, and I forgot it and, and didn't answer the BPS question. We are working with BPS to um, to or like to outreach to and connect with BPS parents um, directly. So um, I'm hoping to become more uh, effective with that in the future. But that's definitely something I noticed that's a gap in coordination, especially for BPS parents or even future BPS parents to know how they can be support, supportive as parents, but also for them as adults who also need support as, as parents. Thank you. Uh, Council Lu Jen, did you have a final question? 
Yeah, just for the record, because uh, Director Wen, you talked about like being very judicious in the use of that 1.1. If we could, through the chair, get a uh, breakdown of how much of that ARPA funding has been used and, and, and for what purpose, um, I think uh, that would be influential for the council to know. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for your effort and that foresight to get that funding that we needed um, this past year because it was really critical. Um, and I realized that that money was also um, we had until the end of FY24, 27, 26 to use as opera funds. And I wanted to make sure that we had enough to, to save for this long haul, but making sure we maximize all the resources. So we already have allocated uh, with one, um, we we move that to MOH because their their infrastructure has they have more better infrastructure to. Right, which is why I thought this was an MOH. I thought it was with MOH, so I wasn't going to ask you, but then you 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 know brought it up in terms of. Yeah, I wanted to explain all that because because uh, you did that work, so I want to make sure that what we did with that money to be transparent and also. Uh, uh, courteous of, of what uh, we've done with that money. So we moved it to MOH because they have more of a efficient system to handle housing, um, housing supports. And mm -hmm. then we worked with them closely to allocate that to an organization that can culturally appropriate, uh, culturally uh, competently work with Haitian new arrivals. So we dedicated a 30, uh, 330,000 to IFSI, who will be doing, who has been doing and will continue to do the housing of new immigrant, new immigrant arrivals. But then we're saving, we're saving 100K for Moya so that we can actually uh, be granted to the community who are front lines of new arrivals work. So we would plan to do that in the fall. And the rest of it that's still in MOH, we're, we're just saving that for like emergency rainy day um, housing support if we're not able to activate state and federal resources. And I just want to name that we've been really um, pushing to access, uh, use a lot of the federal funding um, that we are applying to to get before we expend that, that really important money that you hard earned got for us. So um, that's where we stand with that, that fund. Thank you. I appreciate that. If we could still just have a written breakdown sent to yeah. us. And I, I, mean, I don't know if it's you or if it's MOH. I can talk to Shayla. I mean, she, she, we're going to be talking about this. But since you mentioned it, I was like, okay, should I ask you? I don't know. So. Yeah, it's okay. And I think it's important for me to, to tell you what I what happened with that funding because you got it across originally. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lujan. Um, Director uh, Nguyen, thank you so much for uh, responding to the, to the questions, for the presentation, for your work. Uh, you only have two questions to submit uh, from Councilor Murphy and Councilor uh, Lu Jian. Uh, we look forward to, again, inviting you to our working session if necessary. Um, if not, uh, we'll see you soon. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we have the Disabilities Commission. And we're joined by our panelists today is uh, Commissioner uh, Makash and is there anyone else joining you? Did I? No, nope, just me. Okay, all right. Um, thank you so much. Welcome. You have the floor for your presentation. Thank you, Council, um, Madam Chair, uh, Council Pre President Flynn, and all the other councilors for giving me this time today to speak about my work and my proposed budget. I do have a short slide presentation, um, if we could pull it up, and then I'm happy to answer questions. Great, thank you. So our office aims to increase opportunities for people with disabilities in the city of Boston by ensuring full access and equal participation in all aspects of life. We work on eliminating barriers in municipal policies, procedures, programs, and services, as well as in architecture, communication, and attitudes. And this language comes from our um, ordinance that the city created to create our um, commission in the 1980s. And we do live by that mission today, so it's still very relevant. Uh, next slide. So our mission is to, uh, basically we work on systemic access. So we lead the city's collaborative efforts to ensure accessibility and inclusion in all programs, policies, public rights of way, and municipal buildings in Boston. We strive to create ideal access, which means we push people to go beyond meeting only the bare minimum requirements because we feel like the city doesn't do that in any area and we don't wanna make disability some uh, a low bar to meet compliance. We want 
to create ideal access. And I can give you some examples of that later on. But as I said, the primary focus of our office is to create systemic access. And we do this by working with all other city departments to make sure all the work they do is accessible and inclusive. And this would be policies, programs, services, communication, built infrastructure, and the built environment. And we'll go to the next slide. So this is just a small list of some of the uh, city departments that we work closely with on systemic access. Um, public works, we work very closely with them in reconstructing uh, sidewalks, intersections, um, any type of work that goes on in the public right of way. The transportation department, we work closely with them on bike lanes and um, accessible pedestrian signals, um, a lot of transportation studies to look at pedestrian access. Um, my staff is really plugged in with the um, active transit team. Public facilities, um, as you know, we just unveiled the brand new accessible city hall plaza last fall. So we're working closely with them on projects, um, not only in city hall, but across the city um, in Boston Public Schools, which I have listed uh, below, and libraries, uh, BCYF centers, public facilities sort of oversees all that, and we give them input on accessibility and inclusion best practices. And then, of course, we work closely with ISD. Um, on policies and programs, some of the departments we work with are the elections department. You may remember a few years ago during COVID, um, the city implemented an accessible vote by mail option, which was really um, groundbreaking in the state. And we got a lot of credit for that. And that really, the credit does go to the elections department for working with us to say, okay, this is what people with disabilities need, and we're going to pay attention to it. Um, language and communication access. Um, I listened to Jennifer's testimony and uh, everything she said can be echoed from our department. We pay a lot of attention to uh, ensuring that we have accessible communication, whether it is um, for people who are deaf, hard of hearing, if they need ASL or if they need CART. CART is the live transcript um, on a big screen that you may see at some events, in case you don't know that. Um, I did hear a question about Braille. And to follow up on that, I would say Braille isn't uh, requested as routinely as you would think, like Jennifer said. But a reason for that is because there are so many more technologies nowadays. Um, a lot of people who are blind use audio tools um, or even just conversations. If they had a question, they can still call on the phone, things like that. So Braille isn't our biggest ask, but we can certainly get that done if we need to. Um, we work closely with the Mayor's Office of Housing. We created a Disability Housing Task Force um, six or seven years ago. And we are just reestablishing that now because we met all our goals, but we wanna look at housing policies that trickle down into um, built units and what that looks like. We work closely with emergency management. We're actually part of a team right now looking at RFPs to make sure that um, new notification systems are accessible for people who are blind and deaf. Uh, we work closely with the Public Health Commission. Uh, we really partner with them on vaccines and access to um, treatment and uh, systems during COVID. And then of course, being part of the equity and inclusion cabinet, I work closely with all my other departments, including the ones who are here today. Next slide. And then one thing I wanted to touch on because this is um, a legal requirement. So the ADA requires every municipality that has over 50 employees to assign an ADA Title II coordinator. Title II of the ADA oversees all um, state and local government functions and requires them all to be accessible. So as part of my role as commissioner, I'm also designated as, as the city's ADA Title II coordinator. So in that role, I have uh, certain things I must do, which includes posting public notices of non-discrimination, uh, resolving complaints um, about discrimination on the basis of disability that may be filed with the city, um, we have to make sure that um, like when Public Works is doing like a long range plan, that accessibility is a part of that. They call those transition plans to go from, you know, 20,000 curb cuts that are accessible to 80,000 curb cuts that are accessible. That would be a long term transition plan. So we help with those, all those things. And then next slide. So the ADA has five titles in total. And like I said, we focus particularly on Title II, state and local government services. But Title I uh, has everything to do with employment, whether someone's um, trying to apply for a job or they're already in a job. Anything related to disability and employment is covered by Title I. 
So while the Human Resources Office in the city works on individual cases, uh, we work closely with them on policies that promote equity and inclusion in hiring of people with disabilities. So this is really where we shine. I feel like we give that insight and that input um, to help other uh, departments do their work. And then ADA Title III oversees places of public accommodation. So that's anything that's open to the public. It would be um, restaurants, movie theaters, um, you know, offices, um, anything that's open to the uh, public, retail buildings, theaters, and housing developments that aren't public housing. So we don't have any insight over that either, but we do work closely with our city agencies who license or permit such work like the BPDA, we work with the licensing board. So we work on everything from the built infrastructure with the BPDA, making sure they have accessible units to the licensing commission to ensure that restaurants are by abiding by the captions ordinance. So we do touch on um, everything in Boston and we have an impact, even though we only directly oversee uh, municipal services. And next slide. So some of the services that are provided by our department, even though, like I said, we're mostly um, focusing on systemic access, um, we do have three architectural access staff, two are architects and one is an engineer. So they do plan review on all big developments at the BPDA. We developed what we call uh, an accessibility checklist um, over five years ago. And every project that goes through the BPDA has to fill out this checklist. And it doesn't add any new requirements, but like I said, it's a way to push them to do ideal access. So if they had a plan uh, and they were gonna put all of the accessible units on one floor, we, with the checklist, we would say, what is the location of the accessible units? And if they come back to us with that plan, we'd say, no, we wanna see them scattered so that somebody may want a high rise floor, somebody may want you know, a mid-range floor, or maybe someone does want the ground floor. So we look at things like that in the um, checklist. And that was um, incorporated into the Boston Zoning Code last year. So now it is a requirement for anyone doing development. Um, I also have a seat on the Public Improvement Commission, which oversees all uh, work on public rights of way. I do designate my architectural access specialist, Sarah Leung, um, to sit on those uh, meetings for me. So she does a great job. Um, one of my staff, Patricia Mendez, my um, director of architectural access, has a seat on the architectural access board. So she oversees all um, variance requests, which means when someone in Boston is building, <clears throat> excuse me, apologies, is building something and they don't want to, um, or they're not able to, they say they're not able to make it compliant. Um, they can apply for a variance. So Patricia oversees all the um, variances in Boston and she gets to work with people, proponents, and see uh, what we would support and what we wouldn't support. We also provide training and technical assistance to residents and small businesses. If somebody calls us and says, oh, their mother had a stroke and now she needs a chairlift to get upstairs, Patricia, Sarah, or Sierra will call them talk them through it and give them some advice on how to make the house accessible, even though it's never easy. We also have a series of checklists and self-assessments. This is a great tool that we spread to other city departments. We have uh, one that we're really proud of. It's called the meetings and events checklist. And it's super simple. It's one page. You don't have to be an architect. You don't have to be um, showing up with a tape measure. You literally just answer these 10 questions and then you'll know your meeting is gonna be accessible for people with disabilities. And then for outreach and engagement, we have um, our Disability Commission Advisory Board, which is a group of 13 residents who live in different neighborhoods. They meet monthly to talk about issues of importance in the disability community, and they're the ones who spearheaded the captions ordinance. So um, we have a lot of great work to do with the board, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, we do social media. We have a weekly newsletter. Our staff does information referral. And then we have three main annual events that we are very proud of and we really, really love. Um, our Disability Community Forum is a chance for us to listen to residents with disabilities and that's being held next week. We do that every spring and um, it gives residents a chance to meet me, meet our board members, meet the mayor, um, any city officials who choose to attend and also um, ask their questions like, I wanna go to the Boston Common, which entrances are accessible or are the Swan Boats accessible or um, anything that they may want to know. Or they may tell us what's not working and we're open to that and that will give us um, some things to do uh, as take home items. We have our ADA Day celebration every July. 
and that will be held this year on July 18th. We always celebrate a partner who's done a great job on access. This year we're celebrating the Streets Cabinet because they worked with us on a campaign that we'll be launching next month on, on bicycle safety and pedestrians with disabilities. So really looking forward to that. And then our other big event is Civic Engagement Day. We hold this in the fall and we ask people with disabilities um, to come into City Hall because I know it's a very intimidating looking building, but we say, come on in, you can see the city council chamber, you can meet your city councilors, learn how to testify. So um, we had over 150 people attend last September and we're looking forward to that again this year. Next slide. And then um, a few other direct services that we provide. We run the on-street accessible parking program. We review applications from residents. We approve them and work with the sign shop to get the signs installed. Um, architectural access and community engagement I spoke about, but just to talk a little bit more about the advisory board. Um, this is a group of really committed residents. Uh, the board was formed in 2008 and um, we currently have uh, members who represent diverse disabilities, um, diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds and um, different neighborhoods. So um, we're happy to invite anybody to a board meeting if you'd ever like to meet them, but it's a great group of residents that we call our eyes and ears of the neighborhoods. And then next slide, I think it's my last slide. And this is my staff. Um, I, like I said, I'm the disability commissioner and ADA, ADA Title II coordinator. Andrea Patton is my chief of staff. Patricia Mendez, our director of architectural access. Chris Morowski is a licensed social worker. He does our um, support for constituents. Sarah Leung is a senior architectural access specialist. Colleen Flanagan does outreach and engagement. Kylie Potter does parking, the accessible parking program. And then Sierra is um, a newer addition and she is also working on architectural access. And I think that's all of my slides. Oh, I'm sorry, let me walk. Um, disability demographic data. Um, this was compiled by LCA and I wanted to include it just to give you a snapshot of the residents we speak of when we talk about the importance of our work. So um, as you know, there are almost 700,000 residents of Boston. Um, 78,000 of them, more than 78,000, identify as having at least one disability. And that's only people who identify. We know a lot of people don't identify, um, especially older people who don't like to think of themselves as disabled, but we know they could still benefit from all our work. Um, 40,000 plus residents have an ambulatory disability. That's 6% of our population who are five and older. Um, 15,000 residents or 2% have a hearing di uh, disability. 15,000 also have a visual disability. And then cognitive um, difficulties affect 36,000 of our residents. So I wanted to give you that as a snapshot of who we're talking about when we talk about people with disabilities. And this is only residents. We know that Boston is also home to commuters and tourists from other countries and from around this country and around the state. So. On any given day, there could be thousands of people with disabilities walking on the streets in Boston. And I think that's everything. Good, happy to answer questions. Thank you, um, Ms. Mukash. I will go to um, my council colleagues. I, I haven't been actually presenting. We usually have a, a budget uh, um, a, uh, analyst present here. I haven't been presenting, but I just have to point out that with the magnitude of your uh, department, um, you are one of the very few departments without any discrepancies. Like the numbers are accurate, um, just all across the board, um, just a clean budget. Um, so I appreciate that. And I'll go to our first round of questions to Councilor President Flynn um, and then uh, Councilor Flaherty, if we're still here. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Madam Chair, for the important work that you're doing on disability access uh, throughout your district, but also throughout the city. I also want to acknowledge Commissioner McCosh, someone I've had great respect and admiration for for many years, not, not just because she's a friend, but for the work she does across the city representing persons with disabilities and in, in their civil rights. 
Um, I, I would also like to acknowledge I have at least one, one disability as well. Um, but I, 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 I respect the work Commissioner McCosh does in her team. Um, so, M Commissioner, I guess my question is, I, I know the city of Boston is continuing to <clears throat> make our sidewalk, sidewalks, the ramps, um, handicapped accessible. Um, I know there was a there was an order that came down, I, I believe it's from the state of the federal government that we needed to invest millions of dollars into making sure our sidewalks were compliant with ADA um, for persons with disabilities. Um, I know that's gonna take a lot of years and, and a, certainly a lot of money, but are we making, are we making progress on that? Um, thank you, um, Councilor Flynn. For that question. Um, so yes, it was um, a consent decree that the city entered into voluntarily with a group of disability advocates. So that um, took place last year. So we do have a 10-year plan to install um, a certain number of curb ramps every year. And we are working away. Like you said, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of resources. Um, so many things impact the public rights way. We have to, you know, um, figure out like if there are like outdoor dining issues that, you know, that impacted a lot of work that um, Public Works did. But as far as the curb ramps, um, we are on track. We um, didn't meet our goals for the last few years for a variety of different reasons, but we have them um, still pending and we hope to catch up this year. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and, and one, final, one final point, I love, I love being with your team for the various events that you have across across the city. But what I especially like about the event is when, when residents with disabilities come up and they talk with your, your team and your staff and your staff provide, provides them with some good information about services and programs. And as a city council or as, or, or as a resident, there's nothing, nothing better than seeing a resident coming up to a city official, um, engaging with them, and then learning about what programs are available. So, just want to just want to thank you, but also encourage your team to continue doing that because it go, it goes a long way, and um, it really helps so many so many people with disabilities. Um, Madam Chair, I have I have no further. Questions. Just want to say thank you to you, Madam Chair, and to uh, Commissioner McCosh and our team as well. Thank you so much, Council President Flynn. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, I've had the benefit of obviously knowing you uh, my whole life, uh, so I know how hard you work and how much you care and uh, the difference that you make uh, in the lives of people uh, and visitors, people across the city and also visitors. So, and I appreciate how responsive. Uh, you are always out uh, to my team um, as well. So, and it's really a testament to, I think, the, the work that you've done as our commissioner. And when I first started here a long time ago, our Disabilities Commission wasn't really engaged in a lot of the various departments that, that you have um, um, engaged with, which is extremely important. And I think under the leadership at the time of uh, Mayor Walsh and now obviously Mayor Wu, giving you the wide latitude to be involved with public works, to be involved with BTD, to be involved with inspection services, with the BPDA, ISD, BPS, uh, elections, BPHC, um, emergency management. I mean, all playing vital critical functions for our city, but never really having sort of a lens um, to, uh, to the disability community, persons with disabilities. So you've been a huge leader and trend center in that regard. So we are lucky uh, to have you and appreciate your attention to detail on that. And, uh, as of reference to some folks earlier, and I know you've been on the hearing since uh, it started, uh, please let us know what we can do as you continue to grow and you continue to, to get involved in, uh, in other areas of, of city government and, and they're um, uh, bringing you in to the equation, which is a big piece of it and getting your expertise and getting your team to be involved with them. As we continue to grow as a city, uh, that demand on you and your department is gonna also grow. So don't be bashful. Um, you know, oftentimes you you tend to some sometimes be quiet and um, and you just do uh, what you do with the resources that you have. But please take the opportunity to do a full assessment of uh, 
where you are now, where you want to take our city uh, and lean on us. Um, if it's a personnel issue or if, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, equipment, uh, you let us know where we can help you perform your job um, to an even higher level that you're currently performing. So that's it uh, for me, Madam Chair. I just want to commend our commissioner uh, who does a tremendous job. And we are, again, as a reference, lucky to have her. And it's so exciting to see uh, her engage and work with all these other departments to bring those issues to the forefront. And the last slide, I think, says it all in terms of the number of folks that uh, have at least one disability. And then you have some sight impairment and you have hearing impairment. You go right down the list. We have to be better. We are better. And we are better because of uh, Commissioner Mercosio leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. And I will just really um, want to give a lot of credit to my staff. Um, there are eight of us, uh, soon to be nine. And um, we're a really uh, well-oiled machine at this point. But really, um, you know, I, I have the vision and the leadership, but they do the work and they all do an incredible job. And uh, Council Anderson, I have to give credit to Andrea Patton, my chief of staff, she did the budget. And I agree, it was a very uh, straightforward budget and it uh, looks great. So thank you. And uh, Commissioner, when I joined the council, I believe that um, the, the team was two, maybe three folks. So the fact that um, you've grown the department to nine and you're in uh, all these other areas, it's tremendous, tremendous work. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Uh, Councilor Lujan, you have the floor. Sorry, Council, is Council Braden still with us? Council Braden, you have the floor. Council Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Commissioner McCaution. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, I want to shout out your chief of staff, who um, is also amazing and has come to my own very personal uh, street to assess um, accessibility issues. And I just really um, appreciate uh, that hands-on approach. Um, I am happy that your office is growing. I have a question regarding um, what I've heard from some folks about how we make our small businesses more accessible. Um, and uh, I know that uh, compliance with the ADA is a requirement, but we still have our, some small businesses that struggle with making their small bookstores or their shops that they've had for years and years and years accessible um, to all of us, no matter how we are abled. And so wondering like what work your office has been doing. I, I you know, I had the idea of like, you know, could we possibly have um, uh, grants were able to support, you know, businesses that have been that have been in business for 50 plus years that want to make accessibility updates. Um, are we able to support them in, in financial ways? So just would be would love to hear your take on, on that. Right. Because yeah, I want I want if people want to buy books and they want to buy books from their local bookshop, I want them to be able to do that instead of like going to big box chain to do that. And, and big box chain has an easier time complying with ADA because they have more funds and things of that nature. So that, that's that's the genesis and the root of this question and issue as it was brought to me uh, by someone who is um, disabled. Yeah, and we feel the exact same way. We want to support local businesses, small businesses, main streets in the city. So um, this is really good timing that you asked that question because um, in the past few months, we've started um, a few programs. One of them, what I mentioned in my presentation was checklists and tools that we give out. We created a, what it's called a self-assessment accessibility survey. And again, it's, it's uh, very non-cumbersome. It's probably about eight pages and it's for small businesses who don't have like a big backer behind them, like a Walmart or something. It will be for someone like on um, Broadway in South Boston. They might have one step. So it's a list of things that they can assess their business for. And then to accompany that, we have um, a document that talks about free and low cost accessibility enhancements. Mm -hmm. And then also a document about um, tax incentives for creating access in your business. Recently, we've begun to discuss um, the possibility of some grant funding to give out to businesses on Main Streets. We are working with the Main Streets office to, um, to try to make that happen. We um, will looped into their national conference, which happened in Boston this year. Yep. So we have a lot of irons in the fire when it comes to small businesses. And you're right. I mean, Main Street USA, when you think of it, you think of the little shops with one step. And that one step can be a huge barrier. Yep. But we can mitigate it. Things like put a doorbell on with a sign that says, if you need assistance, please ring the bell. 
I mean, there are a lot of tips that we give people that don't cost much and uh, would really increase accessibility. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that you're working on it in partnership with Main Streets. I'm happy to be supportive um, however we can, either formally through this budget or um, uh, later on. So I appreciate that and love getting an, an, an update on the work that you're doing around um, uh, compliance with the closed captioning ordinance. So just thank you for all of the work that you do um, um, and, and happy to support. Thank you. And just wanna thank all of the folks um, in the disability community who make sure that we are always actively thinking about these questions as well and that we are centering, um, centering their voices and needs. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lujan. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. I'm sorry, I, um, I don't have any questions, thank you. No worries. Councilor Murphy? Um, Councilor Murphy is no longer with us. Uh, Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Okay, um, that's okay. Uh, Councilor, uh, Commissioner, thank you again for your presentation and your wonderful work. Um, I guess, you know, in the interest of, you know, just uh, racial equity across the city, um, we're always looking at departments and figuring out, trying to figure out how are we, um, as Councilor Mejia always puts it, getting our return on investments, how are we measuring it, how are we monitoring it, um, and I just wanted to ask you in terms of your capacity in your office with its, itself, um, what if you could, if you, and if you don't have it here, if you can send the, demogra the racial demographics of your staff. I saw some pictures, not others. I'm not sure what they are, but um, if you could be specific in submitting that unless you have it today. Um, I know that um, two of my staff are um, identify as BIPOC. Um, in that community, so um, I, that's probably um, the most information I have right now, but I can definitely follow up with that. Okay, wonderful. Um, also, in, in the same breath, you know, what um, did, in terms of demographics, male, female, um, also race um, and uh, pay equity is important to us as well. Um, looking at that while we go through budget and how we can support um, women as well in um, equal pay. Um, I don't have any other questions. If there, if any of my colleagues have any further questions um, beyond here, as I mentioned, I've gone through the breakdown or the analysis um, of your budget. I really appreciate it not having any questions at all, understanding exactly what it's for and backed by work, backed by policy, as Council Laurel had mentioned to me um, previously. Um, just uh, amazing work and I really appreciate it. Um, again, looking forward to continuing conversation about how to support you and in increasing uh, racial equity or uh, population of in staff um, in your office as well. All right. Thank you, Council. Absolutely, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, thank you. Uh, if there are any, if, no, if you have no other remarks, um, you're free to, to go. All righty. Um, next, we have, last but not least, um, the Veteran Services uh, Department. And we are joined by Commissioner uh, Rob Santiago and Bella Jambuso, uh, is that is that is that is that how you pronounce it? Oh, that's correct. That's Council. very close. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> how do you how do you pronounce your last name? Jambuso. Jambuso. Okay, thank you, um, Commissioner. Uh, we we you you can get right to it. Uh, the, you have the floor for your presentation. Did you have a slide deck to share, or just you was going to speak? Uh, no, I just have uh, just a couple of uh, remarks to uh, to kick off our, our portion of the, the hearing here. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, you have the President Flynn. <laughs> thank you. 
Uh, Madam Chair, President Flynn and city councilors, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of Veteran Services. Um, as you have mentioned with me is uh, Bella Giambuso, who is our senior budget analyst, and she is one of the people that keeps me out of trouble here in the office. Um, I want to thank uh, the council for your flexibility. Uh, this morning I flew in uh, from D.C. Uh, yesterday I had attended a meeting that was sponsored by the Blue Star Families Organization at Bruce Allen Hamilton's um, uh, Helix uh, facility. Um, so real quickly, I just really wanted to talk about this because it, it goes along with what we're doing in our office here. Um, there were a lot of nationwide leaders from the veterans and military communities. And, you know, we discussed best practices on how we can uh, advocate and strengthen our support for our military and veterans and their families as well. Uh, uh, the Blue Star family just recently released a report. Uh, this data, along with the combined shared experiences that we uh, talked about yesterday, is going to lead us uh, to ensure that community action and solutions are going to be used to enhance the quality of life of our uh, military and veterans community uh, here in the city of Boston. So I'm very excited about that collaboration uh, with Blue Star families, with the uh, Booz Allen Hamilton folks, and as well as all those that were in attendance yesterday. So that conversation um, is going to, uh, to continue. They, did, they do have the report, so if you're interested in the report, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to share it with anybody who is willing to read the survey uh, uh, that they put out. So our military and veterans, um, as we all know, have answered the call in times of crisis and uncertainty. They have left their families to face the enemy, both seen and unseen. They have given their blood, sweat, and tears, and even their lives to protect our freedoms and our way of life. When there was a need, they answered the call. Now it's incumbent upon all of us to return the call in their time of need. So the mission of the Mayor's Office of Veteran Services is to facilitate full and equal participation in all aspects of life for our veterans who call the city of Boston home. The Office of Veteran Services, we recognize, we engage with, all our military service members, all our veterans and their families and survivors. And we do this by connecting them with the benefits, services and resources that they've all earned. We strive to find innovative ways to support our veterans, to support our service members and their families to live a healthy and thriving lives. So it's important to have this office become a one-stop shop and continue to bridge the gaps for all our veterans and their families, who again are our neighbors here in the city of Boston. One of our main mandates is to assist uh, Boston's low-income veterans and their families, as well as veterans experiencing homelessness. The financial assistance program known as Mass General Law Chapter 115 acts as a resource of income for our veterans experiencing homelessness and for at-risk veterans. Uh, these benefits also include military burial assistance, subsidies for medical expenses, and also decorations of veterans' graves and hero squares for Memorial Day, which is this month, here in the month of May. Just also wanted to talk about um, a lot of the in-person events that we uh, started uh, ramping up again this past year. We've had some very successful events uh, for our military and veterans community. Uh, two that I want to uh, focus on and, and speak about include the Women's Roundtable and the Black Veterans Appreciation Brunch that we've had just recently. These two, event these two events included members of our veterans and active duty communities as well. These events continue to allow us to promote our programs, to promote our services, and to ensure that the benefits that they have earned are available to them. You know, we understand that all our veterans and their families cross all demographics here in the city of Boston. So it's, it was incumbent upon us and very important for us to include other city departments. You know, at this event, we have coordinated with and worked with Women's Advancement, Age Strong, the Black Male Advancement uh, uh, Departments, just to name a few. They've also had an opportunity to speak on behalf of their department. So we had Frank Farrow, um, Alex also uh, speak uh, uh, during the Women's Roundtable. Um, so this also, what it does, it enables us to include our external partners and give them an opportunity to expand their reach into our veterans community and our military communities as well. A lot of these uh, events are on our website and is updated regularly. It seems like every month there's something going on in the veterans community. So it, for an updated list, just go to boston.gov slash veterans or contact us here in the office and we'll be more than happy to share any and all information that we have of all our upcoming events that are very impactful to our community. You know, we also uh, maintain great partnerships, like I had mentioned a second ago, with other veterans organizations throughout the Commonwealth. Many of our veterans are transient and jump from city to city. So we have to maintain close communications to ensure that the veterans 
are taken care of no matter what town or city they relocate to or when they come into the city of Boston here as well. But as successful as our programs and outreach has been, there's always room to expand and make things better. There are many different ways that I plan on expanding our outreach and promoting uh, the Office of Veterans Services. But I always go back and believe that the most effective way is to go into our communities and meet with our neighbors and educate them on the services and resources that are available here in our Office of Veterans Services. I continue and plan to continue to attend you know, different post meetings, rather they be the American Legion, the VFW, the DAV, and also community meetings. You know, recently I've spoken to many of the liaisons in, uh, with ONS, and I've talked to them to also let me know of any meetings that they're going to where there'll be a value for our office to be a part of. I will also be reaching out to a lot of our younger veterans that are here in the city of Boston and continue to go to our senior centers. And this, again, is in partnership with a strong committee. Um, some people that I would love to recognize is the staff here at OBS and the Office of Veteran Services. There's no way at all that I'd be able to do this work alone. And I cannot be any prouder of the staff that I have and how they continue to work tirelessly in taking care of our veterans. You know, like I mentioned earlier, our veterans and our military folks have always answered the call in times of crisis and uncertainty. They have left their families and lives behind to face again the enemy seen and unseen. They have given their blood, sweat and tears. So now again, I'm very happy to, you know, be their voice, to be their advocate, and to engage with them to ensure that they're taken care of. So I look forward to continue working with the council to ensure that our veteran service members and their families have access to all these benefits and services. So I want to thank you for your time and all the work that you do. And today is May 4th, so may the 4th be with you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, I'd like to just uh, share my screen for a moment just so get to get people um, a chance to look at your budget. Um, I'm really interested in, in um, understanding your services and how we can support you in doing this work. I think I can just share. Right, Ethan? Okay. Yep, you should be able to just share, Counselor. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to, um, my council colleagues should have, you guys should have had this uh, sent to you already um, from Arsenal, I mean, from Karishma, sorry. Um, but just going through it, the operating breakdown for Boston Vets um, and here, uh, the explanation has already been given by the commissioner, so I'm gonna skip that. Um, Commissioner Santiago just would like to understand a little bit about who is in your um, org chart, um, its demographics, and how are you representing people, uh, the, our veterans in Boston. Um, as far as the recommended by expense type, here you see that the current charges and obligations is 69.5% uh, total of $3,331,008. Um, and then for personnel services, 25.4%, $1,204,920. For contractor mm -hmm. services, a total of 3.9%, $185,702. And supplies and materials, just 1.5% at $71,550. And then here, when you look at the breakdown over the years, um, as you can see, it's the same breakdown, but just sort of over the years, uh, blue being FY21, red 22, and then um, and on up to date. For uh, spending changes, uh, you can see here that occurring charges of obligations in terms of changes from uh, FY23 to 24. The difference is laid out here, whether negative or positive. Um, and then for um, spending um, change again in percentage. We're not going to uh, get deeper into it, but that's just so to give us a quick overview, um, just so we can understand what you're working with. And my questions are gonna be about the need um, and do you feel you are where you are need, need to be in terms of uh, budget 
requirements in order to provide the services. Um, but first, I would like to open the floor to our uh, Council President Flynn, um, who is uh, obviously a honorable uh, veteran himself. Uh, Council Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the important work you have done in support of veterans in your district and in across the city, really across the state, supporting military families. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also had an opportunity to privilege really to work with Commissioner Santiago for, for many years on important issues impacting the veterans community, including supporting women veterans, veterans of color and certainly certainly disabled veterans, but also Rob, um, the LGBTQ um, veteran community as well. Um, let, let me ask you a question, Rob, on women veterans. I, I know the VA has great medical care for women veterans in Jamaica Plain and West Roxbury, not necessarily the case across the country, but improving. But that's why it's important that you, and I know you do this very well, but you are engaged in what's happening nationally, because what's happening nationally impacts our veterans here in Boston. So why don't you give us an idea about how you advocate as a veterans leader with other veterans leaders across the state, because that's that's critically important about getting services locally here in Boston. So it's also about relationships that you make across the country and in Washington, D.C. Oh, thank you, Council President, for the, for the question. Uh, and it is a very important to be able to work with and engage with uh, the women veterans, uh, not just in our community, in our state, but also nationally, because what happens nationally trickles down and it eventually is going to come down and affect us here uh, at, at the local level. Um, I'm pleased to say that I have a great working relationship with the Women's Veterans Network, which is uh, which is uh, the director is Susan McDonough, who's a veteran herself, and she's also the uh, president of the Allied War Council and also the commander of uh, the American Legion Post in uh, in South Boston. So we have a great working relationship uh, with them and also with the Boston VA. Um, I couldn't agree with you more that the services that the Boston VA uh, offers our women veterans is above and beyond any other uh, VA healthcare system in the country. And that was pretty evident from uh, some of the conversation that we had just yesterday at the um, at the Blue Star Families uh, uh, roundtable that I was a part of uh, down in D.C. But the work continues, uh, as as you know, um, and just to let everybody uh, on this call know. The women veterans demographic is the largest growing demographics in the veterans community today. Right now, we have approximately about 8% of our women veterans here in the city of Boston. And it, it was is up a couple of percentage points from just a couple of years ago. Right now, nationally, I believe the number is up to uh, over 20, uh, 22% um, nationally as well. So it's very important that, that we amplify and that we really go down to the trenches to take care of our women veterans because a, a lot of the services that they require are very specific uh, to, 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 uh, to their needs as a woman veteran uh, as well. So it's something that we continue to do, it's something that, uh, that, that we're gonna continue to advocate for and engage with the women's community as well as the, the, uh, the veterans community here in the city of Boston and with the new executive office of veteran services uh, in the state. Um, on the Secretary John Santiago, who's really uh, focused in ensuring that that their voices are heard and that they are taken care of at, at the state state level as well. So those partnerships are great. And uh, 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 Council President Finn, you know, as a fellow uh, veteran, I also wanted to thank you. I know just a couple of months ago, I had the uh, the privilege of going down with you to D.C. to advocate for our women veterans, for our uh, 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 BIPOC veterans, as well as our LGBTQ veterans and all our veterans to ensure that those people in D.C. that uh, heard the voices of our Boston veterans up here in our city. So thank you for that. that thank you, Rob. And um, I see Bella on as well. Thank you, Bella, um, to your team, um, to all of you uh, for the doing important work. Uh, Rob, I'm gonna give my um, council colleagues um, more of an opportunity to ask questions. I, as I talk to you at least once or twice a week, but um, I know what other issues that you and I have focused on 
is supporting our LGBTQ veterans, veterans of color, uh, making sure that they're treated with respect and dignity, but equally as important, making sure that there are services, uh, programs for them that they have earned. Um, mm -hmm. But let me, let me stop there because um, um, I wanna give my colleagues an opportunity to weigh in, but I wanna say thank you to Councillor uh, Councillor Anderson for giving me the, uh, this opportunity, but more importantly, thank you, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, for the important work that you're doing. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, Commissioner and, and Bella. It's great to see you, and always great to be in your company. And uh, as you know, obviously, the City Council, even prior to, to, to your arrival, has always supported uh, our Veterans Affairs Department uh, giving that department the resources uh, they need uh, to respect and recognize the service of men and women uh, who have um, served in the armed forces and, and particularly those that um, uh, unfortunately uh, gave the ultimate sacrifice and then obviously our gold star families. And so um, what I, I like about uh, you commission is your sincerity and your enthusiasm uh, when you're at these events um, and you are respected locally, you're respected across the state and you're respected nationally and so it's always uh, great to be in your company. And uh, and even as recently as uh, we had an award ceremony, I think for a JR OTC program. Um, and um, and I just, it, you could just sense that uh, all the kids wanted an opportunity to speak to you. You made it a point to make sure that you spoke to the kids individually. And so for, from my perspective, you know, that's what it's all about um, when you're in um, city government and uh, you're in public service and you have to exemplify that. Uh, to the nth degree, so we are lucky to have you as as our uh, commissioner. And on that note, uh, Commissioner, just want to talk a little bit about um, the JROTC programs. Obviously, we're sensing that there's a, a recruitment issue maybe nationally, and is there something we, uh, as a city, Boston, we've always uh, prided ourselves in, um, in uh, the men and women that we send to the armed forces. In fact, our neighborhood council, President Flynn and I can attest that uh, no neighborhood uh, sent more and lost more during the Vietnam War than, uh, than South Boston. So I know that we're also a community in a city that uh, never forgets our veterans and wanting to see whether or not uh, we have the ability to maybe uh, grow and expand these JROTC programs. And then also I wanna get your opinion on the local veterans posts. Um, don't seem to be sort of have that um, level of engagement that they may have had when I know when I was younger and or uh, when my dad who also uh, like you and council president served in, in the Navy. Uh, folks come home from service and they would kind of gravitate uh, to the local veterans post, but the local veterans post was a real sort of a, uh, you know, a cornerstone, a big piece of the community, along with our community health centers and our local sports teams. It's kind of, those, our veterans post have sort of kind of lost a little bit of that. And I don't know if it's just that the uh, the younger men and women that are, uh, that are our veterans, they, they don't necessarily gravitate uh, to the posts that say they may have none in the Vietnam and the World War II, et cetera. But I'd just love to get your thoughts on the JROTC program and whether we have the ability to throw a shoulder into it and, and grow it across our city. And then to like, you sort of feel the same way about the Veterans Post and do you think that there's something that we can do as a city to kind of reactivate them, if you will, or have them be places where uh, we're providing, you know, the basic city services through or we're including them in as a conduit to what we're doing here in, in city government. Uh, as, and, and, and many of them, they, they sit on, uh, you know, they, grow, they, they hold great pieces of real estate uh, some mm -hmm. of them are in disrepair. Uh, some of them are struggling to keep those doors open. So what partnership can we create as a city with our local veterans folks to kind of uh, re-engage them uh, in a way that uh, may encourage community to get involved a little bit more as well as inspire you know, uh, other men and women to, to join the armed forces. I think we have an opportunity here and, uh, and I clearly we have the right commissioner to do that and would love to partner with you on that. And I, of course, this council would love to partner with you. So. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll sit back and, and just listen to the commission and, and your comments. Thank you, Council Perry, for those uh, kind words. But uh, um, like I mentioned earlier, it, uh, it's 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 passionate work for me, but it's, it's work that I, I I cannot do alone. And it is the folks in the community that actually make a huge difference in ensuring that uh, that our vet veterans across the board are recognized, you know, and honored. Uh, to talk about the JROTC. Those are some of the best young adults that we have in the city of Boston. Uh, they go out there on weekends to do color guards, 
um, at Hero Square dedications to do color guards at our veteran-centric events, rather it be at a memorial or at a post or um, or, or one of the events that that, that we hold uh, here at the, at the Boston uh, Veteran Services. Um, when I first started as deputy commissioner, I believe we had eight JROTC programs in the city, and I believe now we're down to six with one possibly uh, going away here uh, very shortly. I think the program is 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 a program that's that it's it's not a recruitment tool as a lot of people think it is. It's a tool to really have our young adults in high school engaged in their community that they're in to have a structure. Just just so happens that that structure you wear you know you, you wear in uniform. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now, as a matter of fact, on Monday we have a call in with the chief of staff of BPS. Um, along with Lee Fife, uh, the JROTC commander for the city of Boston, and some other leaders in the JROTC program to talk about the program and how we could expand it and, 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 uh, and, and, and grow here in the city. Uh, just to give you um, a little bit more about the JROTC program, every year they do have an essay uh, a program, an, an essay contest. And the top essay winner actually gets a, a $500 scholarship. It's presented by the mayor, it's presented by the city council members as well. Last year, uh, we had it at the mezzanine um, in, in City Hall. And now um, that caught the eye of, uh, you know, speaking of, uh, of the post, the VFW. The VFW has what's called the Patriot's Pen, which is an essay contest that, uh, that, a, um, that if the winner for the state um, will then be, it would be submitted nationally to the VFW. And here in the state of Massachusetts this past year, we got third place. And third place gave that uh, young adult, that winner of the essay contest, $15,000 for a scholarship. Um, locally here in, uh, in the Commonwealth, I believe it's a $5,000 scholarship if they, if, if, if they win. But you know, this is all part of the, you know, the Americanism of, of ensuring that these, that these young adults you know, are given the option, all options are laid out on them as to how they want their future to be. Um, and by taking an option away from them from the JROTC, I think is doing a disservice to these young adults. And I think we really need to work on expanding the program and uh, bringing it back to where it was. With that said though, the post, uh, not, I'm sorry, not the post, that's uh, question two, but the JROTCs that we do have, like I mentioned a second ago, they are very active in our community. And I'm very grateful to them and I'm very grateful to, uh, to their instructors in the schools for ensuring uh, that they, they, they keep, those, uh, keep those JROTCs alive in their schools. And you know, they, they're very enthusiastic about the programs that they have. They're also very passionate as well. And I hear it every day. As a matter of fact, a couple of them were here um, earlier today in the office, picking up their wreaths and flags for Memorial Day uh, decorations. But um, but thank you, Council Flynn, for uh, amplifying the JROTC program. is something that you will be hearing a lot about here in the next uh, uh, coming weeks as we head into the summertime. Uh, with regard to the post, um, I know a lot of the posts, they are fledgling. Their membership is fledgling because a lot of them are aging. Um, the problem with the post uh, is that they have an identity uh, issue. Uh, where a lot of the young service members think that it's a place for the older veterans to go, you know, and have a $2, uh, two dollar glass of beer or something like that. Uh, they're trying to change that image right now as, as best as they possibly can. I myself am a life member of the uh, American Legion and the VFW, as well as the, you know, the DAV. Uh, these, uh, these, these posts are very important to the community. And I think one of the things that we need to do, and Councilor uh, uh, Flaherty, I think you you hit the nail on the head, is having the uh, reengaging the community with the post. You know, um, and uh, a lot of the posts, what they're doing now, they're beginning to open the doors to the community to have the communities come in and start working with the communities to let them know that these posts are here not just for the veterans, but the communities that they're located in as well. You know, I know the Boston Police Post; they 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 do a lot of work. Um, in the Dorchester, Mattapan area, just like the, uh, Post 76 does uh, in JP. Can they do more? Of course they can do more. But um, um, having the community engage with them and vice versa, I think, is something that, uh, that, that, that needs to happen again to keep these posts uh, open and alive for all our veterans. Uh, they offer more than just a place to go. They offer more than just a function room. Um, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, myself and uh, uh, City Council President Flynn, uh, we went with the DAV to uh, D.C. to advocate for our veterans uh, here in the city of Boston. But also the American Legion does that at a state level. The, the VFW also does that at a state level and also Thank at you, a national level. So all these uh, all these organizations they're very they're very important to ensuring that our veterans are taken care of because they do advocate for our veterans and they're just not uh, a brick and mortar post.
Thank you, Thank you Commissioner. And, and Madam Chair, the, um, just for our colleagues edification, uh, the Commissioner had recently on the Hero Squares um, has uh, taken the opportunity to present the Gold Star families with uh, miniature repl replicas of the actual Hero Square, and it's a huge hit. It just goes as a testament to how much he cares and his enthusiasm. And I've heard from families uh, that have received these miniature, um, and I'm so he's got a great relationship obviously with the sign shop, but just another um, another way that uh, we as a city through the commission are reaching out to Gold Star families. So thank, on behalf of my colleagues, commission, thank you for doing that. And on behalf of the Gold Star families who think it's, it's, just, a, it's just a great touch. It's first class, your first class. Thank you again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Council Flaherty. Council Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Santiago, for your service, first and foremost, but for your work, um, for your service as well, um, on behalf of the city and um, meeting the needs of our veterans. I appreciate um, um, everything that you shared and my colleagues for, for their questions. Um, you talked a little bit about how the role of the office is really well, how the landscape of who veterans are has really changed over the years, particularly when it comes to women and how that, how has that changed sort of the services that you and your office need to provide that, that like national trend and shift that you're seeing? How does that change the types of services that your office is providing? Well, um, when I first uh, uh, came to the Office of Veteran Services, uh, uh, we, the main mandate was chapter 115. And that's all uh, we pretty much uh, focused on was uh, Chapter 115 um, and nothing more. Uh, obviously, you know, the mandates around Memorial Day and things that we do Memorial Day, um, you, know, uh, you know, other events, but it was never taken to another level. Um, it was never really what we're working on right now in making it a one-stop shop for all our veterans, for all our veterans' families and our service members as well. You know, um, we've always had an identity crisis. You know, when people think of the mayor's office of veteran services, they don't think of the mayor's office of veteran services. They think of veterans affairs. They clump us in with the VA. Well, uh, we work in partnership and we collaborate with the, with the VA, but we're not part of the VA. You know, we're the city's office of veteran services. But there's also a misnomer with just being called veteran services. You know, we also engage, we also advocate for our veterans and their families. We do a whole lot more than just provide services. And that's one of the things that I'm working on um, in trying to rebrand this office and trying to make it the, the mayor's office of, of engagement, uh, of veterans engagement and military affairs, you know, because it, we, we encompass all of it. You know, uh, you know the counselor uh, Flaherty had mentioned, you know, the hero squares, you know, why do we just do a hero square, um, do the ceremony then just leave it at that? No, you know, we always wanted to take it a step further. We give the miniature plaque, but we also uh, uh, remain in contact with that Gold Star family because Gold Star families also have benefits and services that could be given to them as well. And there are organizations that they could be a part of as well. So, is, so once those uh, Gold Star families are identified through the Hero Square programs, as an example, we could then take that Gold Star family and connect them with those services that they may be eligible for, you know. So, uh, uh, so you know, it's it's always taken about one step further. It's always about breaking down the barriers for our veterans, their families, and and the service members that are currently serving as well. And uh, things have changed, and things have changed, and they're changing pretty rapidly. And we must change uh, with them as well. Uh, we're no longer in that silo. We must, you know, work out of that silo, and not just in the city of Boston and in the state of Massachusetts, but nationally as well, because a lot of what happens at nationally, again, like I mentioned earlier, filters down and trickles down to us here at the local level as well. So it's very important, especially within the veterans community, that I uh, uh, remain up to date as much as I possibly can with those policies that affect us at the state level and those policies that uh, may affect us or are affecting us now in the federal level as well, especially having two major VA facilities in our city, the one in West Roxbury and, and Jamaica Plain. I hope Thank that answered your question. Yeah, it, it did. Commissioner, um, do you have a policy lead on your team? Is there a policy advisor in your office? Uh, thank you, Councillor, for that. Um, we just recently uh, hired, and it was uh, definitely one of our uh, accomplishments uh, this past fiscal year, we hired a policy director who's also our new outreach director, uh, Connor Friend. 
So um, he is going to be in charge with uh, um, ensuring that the policies here at the local level um, are those that benefit our veterans and their families, but also to ensure that the policies that are being talked about in the state house and those that are being put forward in nationally, um, that our voices are also being heard here at the city level as well. So um, he just started a couple of months ago, or actually no, it's less than a month ago. So he's still fairly new in our office. It seems like a couple of months, but um, you know he's doing a great job right now in learning the system. He's actually, um, uh, we, uh, we stole him from Seth Molden's office. Um, but he's a local resident here uh, in the city of Boston, but we're happy to have him and uh, I'm looking forward to working with him and also ensuring that this council knows what we're doing with regards to policy when it pertains to our veterans and our veterans families. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Um, and I'm really glad to hear that you have a policy lead for the very reasons that you stated, right? Um, and think of rebranding is always great. I don't know if, uh, if the councils will let me ask another question. Um, it's something that was interesting, the number of veterans receiving Chapter 115 benefits says it's going from 50, the uh, projected is 53, but the target is 55. So I just found that interesting in the numbers is if, um, if, the, if the target is more than the projection, just hoping that you and your office has the resources necessary to actually like <clears throat> what the target number is. Um, no. mm -hmm. is. If you wanted to. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry for, um, I think the water went down the wrong pipe, but. Um, oh no, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, our chapter 115 numbers is an anomaly while uh, they've been trickling down for so many years now. But at the same time, we see uh, it, it, it really depends on month to month how many uh, veterans are coming in to apply for Chapter 115. And there are a lot of variables that come along with that. Uh, a lot of it depends on the state because it is a state sponsored uh, benefit. So if uh, a lot of times the state comes back and they want more information from our veterans or they come back and state that our veterans uh, do not qualify for Chapter 115. Um, I will say that um, that since I started as deputy commissioner, our numbers have gone way down in chapter 115. That uh, has a lot to do with the fact that our uh, veterans population is aging, but it also has to do with the uh, federal poverty level um, being part of the, uh, the, met the, 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 the metric that's used by the state for qualification of chapter 115. Right now it's at 200% of the poverty level to be able to qualify for chapter 115. You and I know, everybody on this call knows that that just doesn't make sense that a veteran who's earning less than $26,000 a year should only qualify for chapter 115. Uh, while you know we do forecast a, 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 a small increase in that number, that has to do again with our outreach, that has to do with us going out there in the community and ensuring that those veterans that need chapter 115, that qualify for chapter 115, know that it's there for them and that we're willing and ready even if we need to do it on the spot with our laptops, hopefully we get connectivity, um, could help them and assist them in applying for Chapter 115 benefits. We also have the form on our website um, for Chapter 115 as well. So they don't have to come into the office. They don't have to call us. They could go into our website and apply for Chapter 115, and then they'll be contacted by one of our veterans benefit specialists for Chapter 115. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. I, this is not a question. I'm just going to put it on for the record that I know that there's even a disparate um, impact for our veterans of color, um, and, and I'm assuming that the number one question that you get is related to housing. So I'm not sure if there is, um, you know, ways that we can continue to support that, make sure that those who sacrificed um, are being cared for, especially our Black and Brown ones who who, who signed up to um, serve this country. So just putting that out there, and know that um, I'm a partner here. Um, in, in a thought partner here, but also a partner in getting you uh, in your office the money and support necessary through the budget. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilor, for all your for, for your advocacy for our veterans. Uh, Councilor Lu Zhen, you have the floor. I'm sorry, Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Oh, you want to have more time? time? No, just Come kidding. On. You better take a seat there, Lu Zhen. It's my turn. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you, Commissioner, for all your hard work. Um, I just want to talk a little bit more about um, the chapter one, chapter one fifteen. If you could just kind of like stick here for a little bit longer, I'm just curious. Um, can you speak to any specific um, initiatives or programs that the Boston Vets um, is planning to implement in the coming year to better support veterans in how the FY twenty four budget? And you know, and how the FY24 budget um, will increase uh, to support these efforts. Uh, thank you, Councilor, for that question. Um, 
Well, uh, you know, I mentioned about Chapter 115 and um, a lot of the restrictions within Chapter 115. One of the th uh, things that we're doing here in uh, uh, Boston Veterans Services is a program that uh, we are calling Bridge the Gap. Um, it's part of our alleviation fund. And this alleviation fund is primarily for those veterans. Uh, right now, it's an emergency fund for those veterans who don't qualify for Chapter 115. We're looking at extending the program, and it's something that I'll be working with on uh, setting the policy for that program uh, in the near future. I'm working, obviously, with uh, the, the director of policy on that, as well as with my team here to get their input, because I think the, the team's input is very important since they are the ones who process Chapter 115 benefits. So we want to extend it here at the local city level. And to take those parameters from Chapter 115 and tailor them for our residents here in the city of Boston, because we know that a lot of the parameters of Chapter 115 under the uh, the CMR 108, which regulates Chapter 115, uh, in many occasions that's not enough. Which is why some, which is why um, our attrition rate is where it's at right now with Chapter 115. So we're looking with this alleviation fund to ensure that those veterans who qualify and have a need are given that financial support. From the city to be able to uh, to have a better quality of life here in the city of Boston. Gracias. Thank you. I just want to make sure that you're speaking Spanish. All right, so I just have two more. I'm just teasing you. Okay, two more questions, and you're going to have to get these two in before Councillor Anderson puts the, her hand up. Um, I just want you, if you could just explain why the budget for vets has increased um, 1.6 in both um, FY 23 and 24, given that there's a reduction in qualifying vets. Just talk to me a little bit about that. And then what, a spe um, what specific efforts um, that Boston Vets has made to ensure that veterans from historically um, underserved or marginalized communities have access to the resources and support that they need? And what impact have these services um, and supports on improving um, equity in veteran services? Uh, thank you, Council, for those two questions. Um, in answering your first question is that we are building our team. That's why our budget um, has uh, incrementally has gone up. Uh, just uh, for FY23, we've had the two positions <clears throat> that we've uh, that we filled: the one for the director of outreach and policy, and also the integration and transition advocate position that we have recently also uh, uh, filled here. So the integration and transition uh, uh, advocate is a position that's also going to be there to assist our veterans that are marginalized. Now um, I'm going to go back to what. I went to yesterday. You know, a big part of what we discussed yesterday at the Blue Star event, the Blue Star Families event, was inclusion. So, uh, part, a lot of the information that came out of their survey, they've also broken down when it comes to people of color, when it comes to the LGBTQ community, when it also comes to foreign born uh, spouses and military folks as well. If I could share a couple of, uh, a, a, a couple of um, responses from that. Um, experiences of racial ethnic discrimination of active duty personnel in the civilian community that they serve when they're, you know, for a uh, given example, for a lot of the recruiters that may be stationed here in Boston, you know, living in the community. I'm not saying that these numbers come from Boston. This is a national survey. But they, uh, uh, the respondents, 38% of them said that they feared for their personal safety because of their race or ethnicity. 36% said they were subject to racial ethnic slurs or joke in the community that they served. And also another 36% said that their children experienced racially, eth eth ethnically, um, ethnic uh, motivated bullying as well. So these are numbers that are being amplified through this survey to ensure that these communities of color, that these folks that are serving our military are also treated with respect that they deserve uh, and, 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 and also that the civilian community also understand that these people are serving and that they should be treated, you know, uh, uh, just like anybody else in the community as well. So integrating them into the community is something that's very important, um, you know, to me being, you know, Port you know, Puerto Rican myself and part of the LGBTQ uh, community as well is very important to me that all of our veterans, all of our veterans families and all service members that are serving in our community are treated with respect that are treated in the, in the manner that they should all be treated, you know, um, as, as, as any other neighbor in the community. So thank you for, for bringing up that question. And it's something that we're gonna to continue to do. And one of the things that I'm gonna to continue to do is go into our communities, is ensure that we have those impactful events, you know, for all of our community members to attend and be a part of, and bring them, in, uh, you know, and, and, be, and be a part of it, 
because it's very important that these findings uh, are, 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 are taken very, very seriously. And also, you know, one of the things that I want to say real quick, and, and, and I know, uh, I mean, I could go on a little bit longer, but, you know, a lot of our strategies here in, in the city of Boston Veterans Services, you know, we want to be deeply informed by the community. You know, we want to be empowered by the community uh, and, and to hear those voices so that no voices are left out into the work that we do here at Veteran Services. And that's a huge part of, of, of what we're gonna be doing, what we're gonna to continue to do and moving forward that um, all of our veterans receive the benefits and services that they've earned. Thank you. And thank you, Chair, for allowing Commissioner to uh, go a little bit longer. Your grace is deeply um, appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. Councilor Worrell, you have the floor. And um, Councilor Murphy, the Chair of um, Veterans uh, Committee um, has uh, rejoined us, and I'll go to you next. Councilor Rell, are you still with us? Yep, I'm still with you guys. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Santiago and team. Thank you for all your hard work um, and commitment to the city of Boston and to our veterans. Um, I had a few questions regarding the budget. Um, can you tell me, um, aid to veterans, is this direct service being given to veterans? And then how many, um, veterans did you provide aid to um, last year or this year? And what was the average dollar amount given per recipient? And are there any veterans on the wait list for service? And are you able to serve all veterans who request help? Uh, can you uh, can you uh, repeat your, your, your first question, uh, Counselor? I'm sorry, um, I missed that first word. So line item in your budget, 54,500, it says aid to veterans. And it's at $2.7 million. Um, is this direct service being given to veterans? I just want to understand what, what aid to veterans, um, more clarification around that. Sure. So the 545 line that you're referring to, that's the aid to veterans. That's the money that we uh, disperse to our veterans for Chapter 115. 75% um, of that is actually reimbursed back to the city from the state. And 100% of that is, is reimbursed if the veteran who is being serviced under the age to veteran um, is experiencing homelessness. Uh, so that's where that line item co uh, comes from right there from the 545 line. Uh, Bella, did I get that correctly? Is there anything else you need to add for that? Nope, that no, is actually no. correct. Okay. Um, as far as the our average dollar amount, um, I would need to get back to you on that because it fluctuates month to month and veteran to veteran. Um, and I, uh, we, I don't believe that we have it averaged out, but um, the average veteran, uh, I would say, receives approximately, I want to say, 600 a month. Again, some of them receive a whole lot less than that. Others a little bit more than that, depending on any medical expenses that they may have, depending on, um, you know, uh, what their expenditures are, you know, with regards to housing and, uh, and, and utilities are concerned as well. So it fluctuates, but um, we could try to work on an average for you, Counselor, um, and get back with you on that one. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. No, you, you answered my question um, with the reimbursement. That, that answered my question. Um, and then other current charges. Uh, what, what goes into other current charges? I see that from FY22 to FY2023, there was a, a large drop, drop from uh, 6,000. Um, to 600,000. So I just wanted to know what goes into um, um, uh, other current charges and why the jump from FY22 to FY23. So that so that one, uh, Counselor, um, that's the alleviation fund that I referred to earlier. That's the funds that, uh, that we're using for those veterans that don't qualify under Chapter 115. So that money comes out of that. That's why, that's why there was such a steep jump from the six to 600,000, because those are the funds that we use for uh, those veterans that don't qualify for Chapter 115. That, uh, that, that money is not reimbursable by the state because it is being funded by the city ourselves. And, and and are we going through um, in FY twenty three? Did we use all of like was was that enough? Was it six hundred thousand enough? Uh, right now, um, it is uh, enough. Uh, we're within uh, well within the capacity of uh, of the six hundred thousand. Um, again, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, currently we're using that alleviation fund for emergency purposes only, while we work on the process to expand it. Um, you know, uh, so we're looking at right now to uh, uh, get closer to the amount uh, within the next fiscal, uh, uh, the next couple of fiscal cycles. 
uh, with the hopes that maybe at some point, maybe um, um, expanding expanding that program to further reaches uh, to, to improve our veterans' quality of life. Thank you, Commissioner Santiago and team. No further questions, Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Rowe. Councilor Murphy, you have- Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And it's great to see you, Commissioner. Um, so obviously, uh, I'm here to support and make sure, um, you know, as the chair of veterans, but um, my colleagues have been listening in. Um, I'll ask great questions. And just like the committee name is not just veterans, it's military families and military affairs, which really encompasses all you do, right? So just thank you for being such a partner to our office. Most of our calls that come in from veterans are around the housing or what you taught me that day, you gave me an overview of your department and all that you do. Also, all of the benefits that you know they earned and deserve, but have not, you know, maybe not know how to connect to. So, um, you know, there's just a lot you do for our veterans that deserve it. So, thank you for that. Um, and Council Worrell did touch on. Um, I, I, I think you need more money. So please don't take this as a, you know. Uh, why is it doubled? But the current charges and obligations definitely had jumped out when I looked through the numbers, but I think you did a good job explaining that, why that is. So um, in going forward, do you think we'll continue to need that? Is there a way to kind of mainstream that? Or like, wh what do we think about that? Because it seems um, like, like making a red flag and then maybe when, and with this new powers we have, which I know we're all still trying to get used to, but when we wanna make an adjustment or an amendment, we have to take from something. And these like red flags, which almost always have wonderful explanations of why they're there. If we can maybe like put a little note next to it, because obviously it's going to a much needed service. But if you could just touch on that. Yes, absolutely, Councilor. Thank you for that question. Um, and yes, I would love to see this program expand. Um, again, uh, we use it for uh, uh, just for emergency purposes only. We want to expand that, you know, hopefully to uh, may maybe work with, uh, with, you know, adding transportation for our veterans who need to, um, to go to their appointments, yeah. which is becoming uh, a huge thing. We, we're getting a lot of calls, especially as the VA is currently um, outsourcing a lot of their appointments um, to the civilian sector and not having it in-house at the VA facilities. Uh, that's that's so so that's that's a program that we're going to start looking into. But again, like I mentioned, um, once we start working on the policy, once I work with my team to exact that policy, once I go into the veterans community, and one thing that I didn't mention that I think I do want to mention right now is that uh, we're going to be working on a survey. It's going to be I uh, don't recall if there's ever been a veteran centric survey. Um, handed off by the um, uh, or, or, or taken by the city of Boston. But we're looking at having a baseline and lifestyle survey for all of our veterans in all of our zip codes here in the city of Boston. And that's going to be part of our whole rebranding of the office. So, you know, we it's from my understanding, it will be the first ever survey of our veterans population. And all these data that we're going to be collecting from this uh, will help us to provide these better services and care to know where um, you know where the services need to be. It'll give us those tangible numbers that um, the most up-to-date tangible numbers than, than what we've had here. I mean, it's also you know we all know that you know the veterans population in West Roxbury may have different needs than those in Roxbury. So we want to know that we want to have that exactly so we can know where it is where the bridge to gap program needs to be most effective and how it's going to be effective in the different communities that we serve here in the city of Boston. So I'm looking forward for this uh, uh, for this program to expand. Right now we do uh, we are within our capacity. Uh, uh, but trust me that if and when the time comes, uh, you'll be hearing from our office. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I know that Council President Flynn uplifted the ROTC and also Council of Flaherty talked about our posts, which are so important. So I definitely um, agree with all you said, the wonderful things the ROTC programs do and love seeing them out there at the parades, but also the essay contests and the others. It's it's just a great program and I hope we continue in, or expand it even. In the post, definitely um, more than what you said, in my neighborhood, we always had the um, Memorial Day Parade and the post would put the flags into all of the gravestones and also march into the cemetery. And now 
like you said, it's aging and a lot of the younger veterans are not joining the posts at the same rate. So the flags, you know, we just can't keep up, right? Because there's not enough post members. Mm -hmm. So um, working with you and we'll love to continue to, and I know Craig Deold is wonderful advocate there at his post and just supporting the different post members and making sure, because they're more, like you said, than just a spot to grab a beer. They're wonderful mm -hmm. social um, spots for, you know, veterans to gather like-minded needs. And I love to see the old and the young come together too, to support each other. And just want to end on saying, um, it must be the name, I don't know, Santiago Moms must raise great veterans, but we do have a wonderful ally at the State House now too with John Santiago. So um, looking forward to that relationship for to help us right in the Boston level grow and know, not that we didn't before, but knowing that, you know, like you said, we need to rebrand. It's 2023, and how do we all work together to make sure our veterans are getting what they need in a very dignified way? So, if there's yeah, anything awesome. in the budget, you know, I th this is an easy one for me. And thank you to yourself and any veterans on this call, and just all the veterans and their families, including Councillor Anderson um, in the city. That you know, I appreciate all of you do and your sacrifices. And we, like I. I Think of our seniors also. It's not something we're giving you. It's something you've earned and you deserve. So we should not be cutting costs or questioning it. So just want to make sure when things double on the budget or looks higher that it's a clear explanation because I bet you could use more, not not less. So thank you for all you do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Murphy. Thank you, Council Murphy. Um, Commissioner, from the data that we received, it looks like the... Um, 600,000 for the bridge to gap. I think I heard you say it was 600,000. Um, to date, um, for FY23, you've only spent, it looks like you've only spent $8,000. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, uh, a lot of that has to do uh, with the fact that we um, haven't really set a policy for it. Um, and again, we you know, first wanted to have that money allocated uh, to see where the need is. Um, and we just basically just wanted to do it for emergency purposes. Um, you know, some of the uses that we had the money for was for prosthetics. We've had a veteran who came to us that his prosthetic didn't fit well, um, that the uh, the company that did it, you know, did measure it pr uh, uh, correctly on him. So he wasn't in, 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 in a lot of pain. We tried to go through chapter 115 to uh, see if we could get a new prosthetic. We were told go through social security. Well, we didn't want to um, have that uh, that veteran go through the whole process of going to Social Security. We went ahead and paid for his new prosthetic that way. Um, and that was like $900, if I remember correctly. Another one was a widow um, who her oh, husband okay. served. I don't, that's okay. Thank you. Um, okay. I'd prefer it in writing uh, just for the sake of time. Okay. Uh, I hope you can appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Um, the so the eight thousand dollars if it's broken down and you need a policy person in order to, in order to guide the services can you please uh give me a breakdown of the scope of work in terms of like veteran services um i i heard the uh closing the gap or bridging the gap program um mm -hmm. and then there's the obviously connecting folks to uh services or referrals uh to housing um and then I also heard that Bridging the Gap is going to figure out ways of supplementing um, needs beyond what folks are getting. Obviously, $600 a month is ridiculous. Um, and so 600000 if you were to supplement these needs, um, I agree with Council Murphy that it does sound really low. Mm -hmm. And I guess what direction are you going into beyond um, possibly hiring someone to do policy, um, what other services do you provide in veteran service and how are you, I, and I appreciate that you are working with um, the other departments in order to engage and um, be able to reach out to community. Um, but I guess I'm wondering, you know, can we, can we talk about holistically in terms of connecting to mental health services, in terms of, you know, making the public aware that these services are, are exist and obviously, um, do you have any plans um, or any ideas in terms of specific contracts or grants 
that you could put out for veterans to apply for um, through your department? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, well, uh, some of the other services that we offer is we uh, process uh, VA service and compensation, uh, compensation, uh, compensation claims. Uh, we also do uh, the VA aids to attendance, uh, VA disability, and anything uh, dealing with VA healthcare as well. Uh, we assist our veterans if they haven't done so, apply for mass health. Um, you know, so uh, basically anything that they need to come in here for, um, we're either going to help them out uh, uh, with it or do a warm handoff to either one of the other city departments or through an agency that could help them uh, with uh, with that need. Uh, this could, again, include any type of, of VA or healthcare. Um, you know, we work very closely with, uh, with Bright Marine. Um, they also have uh, um, housing on their campus for, for veterans. Uh, we work very closely with the Veterans Legal Services Office uh, for uh, bad conduct or bad paper discharges. As far as those veterans um, who feel that they were wrongfully discharged with a bad paper discharge, and you know, for example, an, uh, an LGBTQ uh, veteran who received a other than honorable discharge. Well, now we all know that veterans um, who are uh, LGBTQ can serve proudly in the armed forces. So for those that got those, uh, those what we call OTHs, we could assist them in, uh, in, in getting them upgraded so they could receive uh, uh, services and benefits uh, with a good conduct uh, 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 discharge. Uh, you, you know, we was mentioned um, a lot of the, the programs that we have that include the Hero Square Remembrance, uh, Gold Star events, uh, POW uh, recognition. Uh, we also have done a lot of town halls where we have, where we hear the voices of our veterans. We've done it with the LGBTQ community. We've, we've done it uh, with, with, with women veterans, and we're going to continue to do that so that we can hear the voices. And from those conversations and from those, uh, those discussions, really try to take all that information and see where, uh, like I said earlier, where it is where we need to move these services, move these benefits forward, and to continue to grow our office to ensuring uh, that we have the capacity to uh, be able to take care of all our veterans, their families, and also the service members and their families as well. How, so will, you do, the, how will you do that? How will you? Well, right now, we, right now we have a staff of six veteran benefit specialists. Um, and what they normally are charged to do is uh, uh, fill out the, the, and process the Chapter 115 claims, as well as do the investigations for VA compensation claims as well. Um, so they, they sit down with the veteran and see what the need is uh, for the veteran. What's um, the, sorry, what's the pay range for the, uh, the six benefits, uh, vet benefit specialists? Bella? The pay range? So they right now there are 15s. Um, I, there, I mean the salary range is that it's an um, SEIU uh, 15 position. I don't. What's the much number money? Um, well, let me just look that up. Give me one minute. Thank you so much. While she's um, looking that up, counselor, um, I could give you a breakdown of our staff as well. Um, Right now, uh, outside of myself, we also currently have a vacant position for the deputy commissioner spot. Uh, they just recently became vacant. Uh, we have our finance manager, who's uh, um, who he is the one who, um, once they're uh, they're approved, uh, sends out the checks for the chapter 115. Uh, Bella is our director of operations, budget, and HR. Um, we also have, like I mentioned earlier, the new position, which is the deputy. I'm, I'm sorry, the director of policy and outreach. We also have two community relations specialists that work uh, with the director of policy and outreach. And the, the, the rest of the staff, we have one administrative uh, secretary, uh, one budget uh, burial agent who uh, must be a veteran as well. And he processes all the, all the burial benefits uh, for our veterans, um, as well as it, um, is in charge of all the uh, flag uh, decorations uh, for Memorial Day as well. And then pretty much everybody else is a veterans benefit specialist and then we have the one trend, uh, transition integration advocate on our staff. What does that person do? Transition and integration advocate, that person is charged with, uh, she's an Air Force veteran. Uh, she's uh, charged with um, one of our also new programs, uh, which is called Guardians, um, a, a graduate to Guardians, um, trying to work that relationship with those future soldiers, those future sailors from our community that are joining the ranks of service and getting to know them, getting to know their families as well. So if and when the time comes that they do leave service, that they do come back to, to the community, they know where to go to. They already have an, a, a, a footprint as to um, how they need to properly integrate 
and transition back into civilian life as a veteran in the city of Boston. But another part of that uh, position is also those returning citizens that are currently incarcerated who, who may be veterans and assisting them as well uh, with their transition back. So we're working with the Office of Returning Citizens um, and also I'll begin to have discussions with uh, the Sheriff's Office as well on how we could implement that position and having that, uh, uh, that staff go into um, uh, and talk to those veterans that are currently incarcerated and how we're going to assist them in uh, returning to our ranks and, um, uh, once they, they come out. That's yeah. the best thing I've heard. I mean, in terms of um, the transition, getting to know the families now, right? Um, so mm -hmm. that you're not working double time trying to find people later, it's, that's, that's amazing. And obviously, um, I, I definitely support the returning citizens um, collaboration. That's really awesome. Um, sorry, Ms. Bella? Yes, hi, sorry. Um, so the salary range for the v, um, VSOs, Veterans Offices, are from 53.5 to 74.6. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then um, in terms of like contractual or, or grants, uh, you, you'll wait for the policy to determine what that looks like. And do you have any plans of hiring someone specifically for community engagement and outreach? Uh, we have the two community relations specialists, um, but under, uh, so the, the, uh, the policy person is, uh, is dual headed. So he also works under the outreach um, side of the house as well to ensure that, uh, that, that we bolster that program as well, because I think it's very important for us to get the word out there. And again, um, a lot, uh, it's, it's, it's yeoman's work, but I think the rebranding of the office and having that survey and seeing what those results of that survey are, it's gonna be huge to how we move this, uh, move this, this office forward. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I don't have any other questions. Um, leaving it to my colleagues that are still remaining in here. Um, if you have any final questions, please raise your hand. If not, um, Commissioner um, Ms. Bella, if you have any final remarks, um, now is the time. Madam Chair, thank you very much for uh, for affording me the time, Council President Flynn and the uh, uh, City Councilors. Thank you very much for um, elevating and uplifting the work that we do. Uh, Obviously, in the city, but also in our office of veteran services, uh, you know, we want to do everything that we possibly can to better the quality of life of our veterans. And I know um, uh, Council Murphy had mentioned um, our counterparts in the state, uh, Secretary John Santiago. I will say that I'm better looking and have more hair than he does, for the record. But um, but uh, having him um, uh, helming that uh, that executive office of veteran services is going to along, also going to go a long way with what we do here in Boston. So we're very happy to um, to work with him and his new staff. I'll be sure to play this recording to um, uh, Commissioner Santiago on the other <laughs> on the other end. Um, Thank you all who attended today, uh, to my colleagues for your involvement and in questions to the administration um, for your work, um, and obviously to the council admin staff and also to um, IGR representative um, Chantel, who is here and made this a very smooth process through four different departments. Um, Commissioner Santiago, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your service twice and service here um, as our commissioner in Boston. And Bella, thank you so much for your work. Uh, looking forward to, um, we'll send, submit some questions if we have them, if any of my council colleagues have any amendments ideas, um, just to, for clarification be prior to um, actually suggesting what you should do with, um, add or retract to your, uh, in your office. Um, council Mejia, you're still here with me, Council President Flynn. Um, if no further remarks, I... No further remarks, no. All right. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. We move to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.